And now for our conversation on the next scientific revolution, please welcome Patrick Hsu, founder of the ARC Institute, which is leading a new scientific revolution in Silicon Valley. Sajith Rikrama Sekora, CEO of Benchling. Heidi Williams, Charles R. Schwab, professor of economics at Stanford University and director of science policy at the Institute for Progress. With Derek Thompson, Hi, everybody. Hello, hello. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I am so thrilled to be able to talk to all of you about this big, unwieldy idea of progress. And it's so incredibly fitting to start with this panel on the future of science. Um, as I said at the end of my interview with Patrick, I think it's so important that we broaden our concept of what progress actually is. As I said, I see it as science, which is how we, in David Deutsch's words, pull knowledge out of nature, is technology, which is how we turn that knowledge into products, it's politics, which is how we ensure the fair and safe and equal distribution of those new products, and finally it's culture, it's our demand for new things in the world. But in that, that pyramid structure, science is absolutely bedrock. And so we have to start uh, with, with questions about science in America today and the future of science. And Patrick, I'd like to start with you. Um, Collison mentioned FAST grants, that uh, experiment during the pandemic. And one of the takeaways when FAST grants did a survey of all of its scientists was that a majority of scientists said they don't think they're working on the most important projects. They're not working on the projects that they want to do. And that is just, and it's kind of an astonishing thing that the US is the scientific leader of the world and yet a majority of our scientists don't think they're working on the most important projects. Why is this happening? One of the funny things that seems to be going on, and I think most scientists, uh, we don't realize this ourselves, is that there seems to be a fundamental misalignment in the general ambition that society has that we should be working on our most interesting, most important, most beautiful ideas, and the fact that increasingly we're doing so in a system that feels really conservative and structurally hostile, right? So if you're a biomedical scientist like me, right? You, you know, generally need to be funded by the National Institutes of Health, which next year will spend nearly $50 billion on basic science, right? That makes the NIH um, and the United States by far the biggest funder of basic science in the world and its biggest enabler. Yet at the same time, in many ways, you have to play by its rules, right? And in many ways, I think we underrate the effects of needing to chase after many different pots of money for very specific types of projects, get the money a year later and start recruiting for them. And then you, the, the, the timeline between going from an idea to being able to actually work on it. And the fact that this is fragmented across so many ideas and projects across each individual professors or labs research portfolios means that we're constantly running around and chasing. And the gap between what we think we can get funded, what we actually get funded for, and what we actually end up doing right, um, it is becoming more and more problematic. It comes down to funding, it comes down to uh, the careers, and it comes down to also the, w the complicated way that we chase papers. Science is not just becoming increasingly expensive, but also really complicated. It's really dependent on complex tooling, complex equipment, things that are becoming really, really expensive. And so, at the same time, the way that we get credit for the work that we do, to be first author or last author on major high impact papers requires us to try to generally do things largely by ourselves or with a very small number of people, right? This in many ways disincentivizes interdisciplinary work, right? Just doing the thing that you have to do to solve the problem versus hyper optimizing for, you know, all of these other, you know, little different things. It's so, in, the, the statistic that gets me every single time is the fact that we spend eight, nine, ten years sometimes turning people into scientists through the PhD program and the residencies and everything. And yet the typical scientists spend some time, somewhere between 25 and 40 percent of their time writing grants. So we train them to specialize as scientists and almost half their job is telemarketing. 
It's begging for money. Like, that does seem like a really fundamental misalignment, and I'm, I'm, I'm really glad, glad that you foregrounded it. Uh, Saji, another really important thing I think we want to keep front of mind is that, as Patrick said, science is getting more complicated. You take a field like genetics. Genetics as a field was invented in the 19th century by Gregor Mendel, just a monk looking at his backyard at peas, and comes up with the concept of dominant recessive traits. That was very easy. Then it moved from individuals to teams. So you have Watson, Crick, and Franklin figuring out the double helix in the 20th century. But now it's moved from individuals to teams to teams of teams. If you look at some of these projects the Broad Institute is doing, it's thousands of people all over the world. We still have, though, 20th century tools to do 21st century science. How are you building 21st century tools to allow us to do 21st century science? Yeah, and I'll, I'll approach this from sort of the angle of industry since my, my fellow panelists are kind of experts on institutional science. Um, and if I sort of zoom out to give the backdrop, which you, you so kindly provided, if, if in the physical sciences, if the, if the 20th century was about chemistry to improve life, we got nitrogen fixation, silicon transistor, nylon, like all amazing discoveries that have changed humanity. I think the 21st century is going to be about biotechnology. Biotechnology will rewrite the medicines we take, the food we eat, the crops we grow, the household goods we rely on every day. And so, you know, I have an interesting lens to this in that I work at a software company. I'm the founder of a software company called Benchling, uh, which we make software to help the scientists who are leading this, this revolution. Um, and we're fortunate enough to work with about 1,200 different companies, so a very interesting cross-section of all this cutting-edge biotechnology R&D. And we really see three major challenges holding scientific progress back that we can, we feel like digital tools can and should, should do a better job of solving. The first is that biotechnology has just gotten incredibly complex. Uh, scientists have gone over, over the last decade from, from building, they've, they've gone in the last decade to build molecules that are now thousands of times bigger than what they would have worked on 10 years ago. Thousands of times bigger, more sophisticated. It's kind of like going from building bicycles to jet planes, but the, the software and tooling hasn't changed. You, you wouldn't build a, build a jet plane with a bike repair kit, and yet we ask scientists to cure cancer, edit, edit genes to cure cancer using paper notebooks and spreadsheets as state-of-the-art tools. So that's kind of the first big challenge. The second is really that there's been this massive explosion in data that are being generated. Scientists have created these amazing new techniques to read, write, and edit the very code of life itself, DNA, RNA, and proteins. And they've also come up with incredible ways to automate experimentation in labs. And the result is this deluge of data that is really hard to wrangle and it's very disconnected and hard to make sense of. And the third and final problem, and I think you, you teed this up really nicely, Derek, is, is actually in specialization and collaboration. Getting these products to market is incredibly complex, requires thousands of people across research, development, manufacturing to bring a product to, to market. Uh, and so this is a new level of specialization and collaboration that the industry just isn't set up for. I mean, look no further than the mRNA vaccines that many folks have taken. You know, those, one of them was discovered, developed, manufactured, and distributed by BioNTech and Pfizer. And so kind of the speed of science changed with, with COVID and kind of created this new, new window for companies to work together to bring amazing products to market. So. Heidi, you have done an incredible job of radicalizing me on a topic that I thought I could never have a radical opinion about, and that is the nature of clinical trials. And we've had lots of conversations about how one of the most important bottlenecks in American science is the fact that there is something fundamentally broken in the way that we do clinical trials today. Um, tell me what you think is broken about clinical trials in America. Um, yeah, I think it's always important to start with, you know, why do we do clinical trials in the first place? Well, we think with, we want evidence that drugs are safe and effective, and normally we generate that evidence through randomized clinical trials. Um, the problem is that randomized trials have been getting incredibly expensive and increasingly so over time. And so Stat News just had a great article where they were quoting someone saying, you know, I remember when clinical trials used to cost $10,000 per patient, and now we've had some where it's $500,000 per patient. And so what firms say is kind of the most expensive part of the clinical trial process is the, the way that they recruit patients. 
and the, what they call the accrual rate, which is the speed at which you identify patients that are of the appropriate condition that you want to enroll in your trial, um, is usually cited as the main reason for trial delays or even trial failures because you're not able to recruit enough patients for the trial that you want to run. And so those longer trials cost more. They also um, erode your patent life. Um, so uh, patents are a big reason why people do investments in biopharma, but you normally need to file your patents before you start clinical trials. And so these trials that last longer, you also get less of an opportunity to recoup some of your investment when you actually get your drug to market. And all of that together means that we're just providing less of an incentive for people to even come in and do clinical trials in the first place. And so I have a, a paper with two of my colleagues, Eric Budish and Ben Rowan, where we basically just try to estimate how big of a problem is this, and it looks enormous. So it looks like this really shapes which trials get done, which drugs get developed, and which patient life years get saved, because it looks like the drugs that we're missing are ones that really would have saved the lives of cancer patients, which is the context that we looked at. Um, so that can all sound like inevitably awful, um, but actually, in my view, when I look at the data, I feel like there's a lot of hints of things that kind of say, we could be doing this much better. So you can look at where are firms choosing to do their trials. Oftentimes it's in markets where there's like uh, faster ways of recruiting patients, and those are actually investments that we could make in improving the processes that we use to do clinical trials. But to my eye, most of the things that are the most promising are things that are coordination mechanisms or they kind of require public goods where you would need the government or a philanthropy to come in because they aren't things that private firms would do on their own. Um, so you kind of need someone to come in and say, you know, I have a vision for this portfolio of investments where it's not just going to be a 3% better, you know, improvement on how quickly we run trials, but if any one of these things panned out, actually we would cut the trial lengths in half. And I think that would just have a really transformative potential to make a difference. One of the policies that I think is most interesting in the last few years is Operation Warp Speed, because in a weird way, it was extraordinarily successful. It's like the Apollo program of our time, but it's been orphaned by both the left and the right. Uh, it's orphaned by the left because I don't think liberals want to give Donald Trump credit for what I would call the Apollo program of the 21st century, but also the right often orphans it because the plurality of their voters rejected the vaccine that was the outcome of the policy. And so I was talking to you about this for the, the feature of the magazine that I wrote, that you think about how extraordinary Operation Warp Speed was at not just funding the vaccines, but turning the obstacle path of vaccine development into a glide path and turning what would have been maybe a 10-year process of developing the vaccines into a nine-month process. And so you and I were talking about this, and I said, Heidi, tell me what an Operation Warp Speed for cancer prevention would look like? What if we took this template and applied it to a, a huge biomedical question like cancer? What would it look like? Operation Warp Speed for Cancer Prevention. Yeah, so, you know, I'm an economist. I'm not a scientist um, and I'm not a doctor. But uh, um, there are technologies that we see in the world that basically give you what economists would call a free lunch. So you get something for nothing. And so one of them is if you can learn the same thing more quickly, um, that's just something that would be incredibly efficient. You don't have to spend any money. You're just creating a technology that lets you to learn more quickly that this drug is going to benefit patients or not. And then you can complete the trial and kind of move on. And so um, there's a lot of controversies over, like, are there free lunches in clinical trials? Um, my view is that there are examples that you can see of where these have been very successful. So for leukemias and lymphomas, um, generally, we kind of have a lot of evidence that if a drug reduces the level of blood uh, cancer in your blood or your bone marrow, that it's eventually going to improve your survival. And so we have much shorter clinical trials for those types of cancers. It looks like you've got a way more trials, and we've actually had many more years of uh, life survival added for those patient groups relative to other diseases. And so, you know, the question is, can we find more things like that that would basically, like, let us learn the same thing more quickly for other diseases? And it turns out that's just a statistics problem. Like, we need kind of more people to work on what validation studies are needed to invest in these things called surrogate endpoints, which let us run shorter trials but get the same information. And so... Surrogate endpoints, right? It's, a, it's sort of like a, a short-term proxy. So the same way that if someone takes a, um, uh, a, a heart disease medication and we realize that in the next few months they have lower blood pressure or maybe lower cholesterol, we can infer that in the long run it will make it less likely to develop heart disease. And so we can approve that drug faster rather than wait 40 years to see if the 20-year-old gets heart disease at 40, at 60. 
that we might be able to do the same with cancer prevention medication. Is that it? Yeah. I mean, one way of thinking about it is the way that we learned that cholesterol and high blood pressure were correlated with heart um, disease mortality was through the Framingham study, which was this multi-decade federally funded study, which suggested some correlations, which then were validated that actually if you you know, reduce someone's cholesterol or reduce their blood pressure, that it is going to reduce the likelihood that they die of heart disease. But we kind of need a Framingham study and the subsequent validation studies for other diseases um, in order to make that same kind of progress. Saji, really quickly before we go to our um, rapid fire final round on what you all are most optimistic that's happening in science today. Um, after clinical trials, what do you consider the most important bottleneck for getting cancer therapies into the general population faster. Like it seems to me that if we, if we take Heidi's thesis seriously, we have all of these breakthroughs or almost breakthroughs happening in science and cancer, that if we could find little tweaks in the whole system, we could get these therapies into our bodies in our lifetime and save hundreds of thousands, if not millions of lives. After clinical trial innovation, what's the next most important thing we could work on? Yeah, ac across our, the 1,200 companies that, that we work with, uh, cancer treatments are probably the biggest area of investment, so I could, I could share a couple observations there. Um, we've seen pretty remarkable advancements in, in cancer treatments over the last couple of years. Uh, one form that I'm really excited about is called a CAR-T therapy. Um, this is a bit of a simplification, and it's going to sound a little bit like science fiction, but it's kind of like being able to re-engineer a patient's immune system to treat and often cure cancer. Um, so you've seen kind of remarkable breakthroughs from you know, companies like Gilead and Bristol-Myers Squibb and, and Novartis, uh, many of whom are our customers and we work with uh, on, on these types of medicines. Um, but manufacturing is an incredible bottleneck for, for this kind of science. Um, this isn't like a a pill that can be mass produced in a factory. It's actually a completely bespoke treatment designed individually for a patient. Um, and so what actually ends up happening is that oftentimes there are you know, subsets of patients that could really benefit from one of these new medicines, but they actually might die waiting for the medicine to be manufactured for them or to get a slot in a program because it's such a, such a bottleneck. Now, the biopharmaceutical industry knows this and, and recognizes it. Um, and I think, again, to, to pull off this kind of science is just an incredibly amazing feat of, of engineering to begin with. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, but the industry still relies on pretty outdated processes, on manual tools, pen and paper, things like that. Um, and so I think it, it's been really refreshing to see the entire the industry sort of re-examine in almost a tech-like way the kind of vein-to-vein -vein experience of delivering these new medicines and, and find ways to make it better at every single step. And so I think after clinical trials, it's probably the, the biggest bottleneck in, in my opinion. Um, I want to move to the, my favorite part of this panel where you all tell me the thing that you're most optimistic, most hopeful for in your particular vein or domain of the scientific frontier. Patrick, everyone else got two questions and you only got one, so I'm going to let you give me two things that you're optimistic for. Do you mind if I tee up Synthetic embryos, is that okay for number one? And then you can talk about your other one for number two? <laughs> sure. Is that all right? So um, I wrote a piece for The Atlantic called um, 10 Breakthroughs of the Year, and I emailed several people about what, I, about what they thought was the single most awesome or fascinating or potentially just thrillingly dystopian thing that had happened in science and technology in the previous year. And you emailed back that you canvassed the ARC team and the thing that got the plurality vote was scientists that developed a synthetic mouse embryo without sperm or eggs. Why is that so amazing, besides the obvious? <laughs> I'm, going, I'm going to tie that in into the kind of broader conversation that we've been having across research and development and trials. And, and I think one key observation is how deeply interconnected all of these different systems and structures are, right? One of the major things that we struggle with in the clinic is how to actually find signal, right? Can we actually predict that whatever chemical matter or drug matter we actually advance into patients is actually going to work? And it turns out that right now biology is very unpredictable, right? Most of the time it doesn't work. And you know, the challenges of trying to make sure first that they're safe and then they're effective is rapidly driving up the cost. That's creating more regulatory red tape. That's making the cycle even slower, right? And so the question is how can we create a glide path 
that allows us to move beyond, between these realms faster and faster, right? And so as a biotechnologist, we think a lot about how we can, you know, in my lab, edit genes, um, or manipulate biological molecules with better precision, right? One of the major impacts of CRISPR and gene editing more broadly is the ability to get causal and predictive control over our genetic information. The synthetic embryo story ties into that in many ways because it's a way that we can prove as developmental biologists and as biological engineers that we actually understand the key steps, right, that, uh, that create life. And so the ability to create synthetic embryos in a dish is a demonstration that we understand those steps and that we can recreate them, right? And so one of the sort of major things that biology needs to get to is higher predictability, right? That's going to involve both better experimental and computational approaches to do that. That's going to involve better systems and structures to take advantage of the increasing progress in science and how we can actually move them outside of nature, science papers, and into the real world where they can make impact on patients. After synthetic mouse embryos, what was the second most interesting and, and exciting thing that you're seeing at the frontier of science? I think we're, uh, uh, you know, there's been a lot of talk about alpha fold, right, in science, right? The idea that we could actually use computers to predict protein structures, right? Now that sort of in and of itself sounds sort of esoteric, why would we really care, right? And so just the central dogma of molecular biology is that DNA becomes transcribed to RNA, which gets translated into proteins. Technologies like gene editing, CRISPR, like RNA interference, antisense oligos, a lot of the drug modalities that we have in genetic medicines allows us to control nucleic acids. They're programmable, they're snippets of code, but it actually turns out the vast majority of the drug industry involves drugging proteins, right? So proteins are, you know, sort of weird, complicated blobs of molecular machines, and uh, most of uh, biopharma involves making small molecules that can actually bind to proteins, but it turns out that we can't really do so in a very predictable way. And so one of the ways that we can really try to accelerate drug discovery and development is to be able to understand the shapes of proteins, what they look like, and then be able to design in a much more accelerated computational way things that can bind to them. So in the, just the last few weeks, there have been a number of papers that have taken advantage of generative AI, right? We've seen chat GPT, right? Uh, sort of, you know, kind of text to language models with sort of the idea that we can not just use a chat bot, but we could actually talk to a computer and say, generate me a protein that can bind to KRAS, some major cancer driver, right? We're, you know, starting to be in the early innings of this very science fiction idea that we could have some sort of natural language or intuitive control or understanding of how to actually, you know, make new proteins that in many ways are not looking anything like anything that evolution has ever invented, right? That sort of, uh, you, know, you know, seeing is believing, right? And measuring is knowing, right? And we're, we're starting to be able to get there with biology. Saji, what are you most optimistic about? I'm most optimistic about the applications of biotechnology outside of medicine. Um, to just give a quick parallel, I kind of see it sort of playing out like consumer electronics, where 2008 onwards, we have this explosive rise of smartphones, and that resulted in chips getting faster, better, cheaper, and getting put everywhere. We have smart watches now as a you know, consequence. We have affordable VR. So in the same way, I see a parallel in biotechnology where you have biopharmaceutical, the medical industry, really investing in the productionizing of, of biology, and I think that's going to have huge applications in food and agriculture and materials and household goods and sort of all these other industries that have the potential to transform the economy and, and our lives. Great. All right, we're, we're filling out our menagerie of awesomeness. We've got the synthetic embryos. We've got computational biology. We've got these awesome spillover effects of the biotech revolution. Um, round us home. What's your most exciting corner of the universe? Um, so I agree with what Patrick said at the beginning about the problems with how we fund science. And the thing that I'm most excited about it is I think a lot of the institutions that fund and support scientific research are interested in trying to do new things and not just making changes, but actually trying to do experiments and trying to understand what are the implications of the way that we structure funding for science in terms of are we getting the most breakthrough inventions and are we getting kind of progress on society's most important problems. And so there's a bunch of people in government agencies that are really committed to trying to do work on this and I'm really inspired by them taking risks and being interested and knowing the right answers rather than just doing things the way we've always done them. I love that. It's, it's, it's a perfect conclusion to the panel because, you know, 
this is about the second scientific revolution. And the first scientific revolution, Francis Bacon, 1605 or whatever, was about, well, the world has studied the most important questions in this way. We have clerics that ask questions. We have philosophers that ask questions. But what about something like a scientific method for asking questions? What about doing experiments in the physical world, seeing what happens, writing it down, and then doing an experiment again? And so we're sort of taking that template of more experiments equals better and applying it to science. We're saying we have, as Patrick was talking about, there's this sense of how science should be done that's emerged from the middle of the 20th century. It's about these big, wonderful, but also heavy bureaucracies of the NIH and the NSF. They do one job wonderfully, but there are more jobs to be done. And that's why I'm so happy that we have people working on meta science, working on startups, working at innovative places like ARC, like you, Patrick. So thank you all very, very much for getting us started with the scientific revolution, and thank you. And now for a conversation produced by our underwriter, PwC, on trust, the new currency for business, here's Ed Bastian, CEO, Delta Airlines, Tim Ryan, U.S. Chair and Senior Partner, PwC. Welcome to the Atlantic Progress Summit. It's going to be a great day. We wish we could be in person, but we're lucky to have Ed Bastian, the Chief Executive Officer of Delta Airlines, with us here today. One of the things that we see happening is the world is changing very fast. Stakeholders have expectations, business is evolving, the public's sentiment is evolving, and trust is becoming more and more important every day. In fact, many would say it's becoming an important currency for businesses, and they talk about measuring it, valuing it, and maintaining it. We're going to talk a little bit deeper about trust. Ed, trust is something you know a lot about. Many would say you can't have a conversation these days, you can't read a study these days without trust being one of the biggest assets a company has. Like, why is that? It's good to be with you. Trust is the currency around which business foundations and the fabric of business occurs. And by the way, it's not just business, it's community. You think about what we do as our business, is that we put people on our planes and we take them in the sky. And Trust in the quality and the safety and the delivery of that service is foundational. But trust goes much further beyond that because trust also means you know, when, when something happens, with, you know, whether it's a cancellation or there's a baggage issue or whatnot, who the customer is going to put trust in to take care of them and to make it right and to be there for them and to solve it. Yeah. Ed, one of the things you like to talk a lot about is the virtuous circle. Could you share with the group, like, what is the virtuous circle? If you take good care of your people, mm -hmm. your people will indeed take good care of your customers who will reward you with their loyalty and their repeat business will allow you to invest in growth so that you can take better care of your employees mm -hmm. and you keep that circle moving. At a PwC, we have a very similar philosophy. The, the philosophy is if our people are happy and well taken care of, it leads to great outcomes for our clients. And if our clients are happy, then our business does well and, and we create more repeat business. And it's a huge focus for us. And one of the big steps that we've taken recently, given where talent is going, what's important is, we call it My Plus, and it is about choice, creating an environment where our people can create their work experience, which gives them the ability to work the way they wanna work and way beyond physical and virtual. How have you evolved as a leader when, we, when you think about transparency as a, as a mechanism to build trust? Well, transparency was key. One, one of the things that we launched during the pandemic was our internal uh, Skyhub, which was our intranet, where we could talk video-wise to all of, our, yeah. all of our people. And it was a week by week, mm -hmm. you know, plowing through a very dark, very difficult, yeah. uh, lonely time. But so many of our people that could see me, they could see I was okay, we were able to expose our biggest vulnerabilities and, yeah. and the risks in a way we never had before. Yeah. And you know, tell, tell, yeah. tell me about yourself, Tim, in terms of how you've dealt with that with your team. I think one of the things we advise our clients on a regular basis is transparency doesn't only come into play when you're right and things are perfect. Like transparency is frankly more important when, when you don't know the answer, when you made a mistake. And one of the things that we do in our business is very similar to yours. When we don't know the answer, we tell our people. When yep. we don't know the answer, we tell our clients. But then we say, here's how we can figure it out. Yeah. Here's the path forward. Our economic times are still challenging. Mm -hmm. The world is still challenged. 
Our people often ask me, what do I think the future holds? And I'm honest, like, I don't know. Mm -hmm. But here's what I do know. What I do know is we're focused on taking care of you. What I do know is we're focused taking our clients. What I do know is we're going to keep investing. But we tell our people the path. We're mm -hmm. candid about the risks. And we do the same with our clients as, as we co-invest. And I, I think that's really important as I think about my, my journey as a leader. It's become clearer and clearer the way you untrust mm -hmm. is you let people know your vulnerabilities. Yeah, I've come to the conclusion that we all need to put our purpose out in terms of who we are as companies, our values, our leadership, what we do, why we do, why we do. And we got to play offense on these yeah. topics. Yeah. And when something happens or something goes wrong, right. I mean, occasionally you're going to have to speak. You're going to have to say something. You're going to have to do something. But it's got to be consistent with what you yeah. what you believe in. It's not just what you believe in. Yeah. It's what your stated beliefs are right. so that people aren't surprised. We have to be consistent about it. One of the hardest journeys I went on was three years ago. We went out with our first transparency report around where we were around DNI. And our goal was to be the most transparent organization in the country. So we benchmarked everybody and we wanted to tell more, even though we knew where we weren't where we needed to be. But right. we felt, A, we felt if we're gonna really be trusted, we gotta tell the story when it's good yep. and when it's not so good. That's right. And then we also like the self-imposed pressure to say, yep. now hold us accountable. So I, I think there are two good examples of, you're right, you've got to have your values, you've got to know where you're going. Yeah, and, and I applaud yeah. you, and I saw yeah. your yeah. your report, and yeah. it, we, we've done the same. Yeah. You know, Delta, a, a yeah. few years ago, we went out with our numbers yeah. around D&I, mm -hmm. and they weren't what you would want them to yeah. be. They're not horrible, but they were yeah. not weren't great, and they show clear needs for improvement. And yeah. we followed it up yeah. each year for the last three years yeah. with how we're doing. We've done a number of studies on trust in, in many organizations where leadership believes they're trusted and where employees or customers are, there's often a gap. Yep. There's often a gap. The CEOs are focused on a number of things and employees are worried more about their day to day. So if I can, maybe I'll pivot to employees again and mm -hmm. I want to maybe hit a couple of different things. How do you close that gap? Because many employees define trust from their perspective or a customer, to your point earlier. <laughs> around their experience here in the moment. Now that we're back out of COVID, I am on the road nonstop yeah. with our people. I know we're not perfect, mm -hmm. but they when, when they can see the person yeah. and they can feel you know, the passion, mm -hmm. that, drives, that drives success. So Ed, it's funny, I, I, I often, as you know, I'm, I'm with hundreds of CEOs and boards. One of the biggest things I advise them is be out, mm -hmm. be close to your customer, close to your people. And as I look to the future, a critical skill set of the CEO and leaders, future leaders going forward, will be human capital. Like as I think about this, always a different time for a skill set in the C-suite, maybe sales, maybe finance, engineering. As we look forward, the war for talent, which is where I like to go next, mm -hmm. and inspiring, motivating people, mm -hmm. it, it, the skill set that the CEO needs probably now more than ever yep. is appreciation for people. But as you look at the skills going forward, like how do you see the skill sets of a CEO evolving? Technology is changing, yeah. you know, in, in, in yeah. lots of different different aspects of yeah. that. Uh, digital yeah. is is such in our business yeah. such a huge part of where we're going, yeah. and trying to change from you know the the hand to hand work that we do with customers yeah. to giving customers yeah. the opportunity to experience our product and under as much yeah. control as they mm -hmm. can as they want mm -hmm. again. And as a result of that, I think we have to all recognize that the the people we have around mm -hmm. us, you know, kind of need to morph yeah. and change and kind of look differently. But I, I come back, Tim, with the notion that if, you, if you're investing in your brand, yeah. meaning putting a quality brand out there yeah. and your reputation, you're not going to have any problems yeah. attracting talent. Last question for you. I know you love to be out in one of the places you go a lot is campus and you, you talk to future talent. If you got the question, as Ed Bastian looks into the future, are you bullish or you're bearish? I am bullish, yeah. uh, and I'm always bullish. Yeah. And the reason I'm bullish is we are coming through, and we've come through yeah. the defining mm -hmm. period, not yeah. just of our generation, yeah. maybe of you know multiple mm -hmm. generations mm -hmm. here. And we've all learned a lot. Yeah. And you know, one of the things we do, we learned about is the need to to maybe slow down mm -hmm. and, and focus on what's important. Mm -hmm. uh, we learned a lot about wellness and yeah. how we take care of ourselves, mm -hmm. how we take care of our social needs, our yeah. emotional <clears throat> needs, financial needs, not yeah. just our, our physical needs, things that we never would have talked about yeah. in the past. And everything I talk about is that it's not about building back, yeah. it's about building better. Yeah. Yeah. And 
in our business, particularly, if there's anything we learned over the last couple of years, mm -hmm. rediscover the power of human connection yeah. and the energy that you see. And there's a joy to that. Yeah. And well, I'll double down on that. I'm, I'm bullish. And when I'm on campus, I get that question in front of my people. What I've seen is incredible resiliency. I've seen incredible teaming, incredible innovation. When I look at the talent that's in this room here at the Atlantic Product Summit, when I look at the talent at Delta, the talent at PwC, what people are doing is incredible. Mm -hmm. like, we've been through arguably the hardest time, and we're still standing, and we're doing pretty well. We're still together. standing. So, yeah. um, Ed, I want to thank you. I want to thank our guests at the Atlantic Product Summit. Thank you for making the time. As always, you're generous with it. Thank you. Next, to discuss how mRNA technology could save the world, please welcome Jane True, Vice President of mRNA Commercial Development at Pfizer, and Francois Vignolt, CEO and founder of Shape Therapeutics, with Ross Anderson, Deputy Editor, The Atlantic. Okay, Jane, Francois, thanks for being with us today. Um, I'm really excited to talk about this technology. Uh, and Francois, I wanna talk, I wanna start with you. Um, one of the things that I find so wondrous about mRNA is that it harnesses the body's sort of pre-existing creative powers. And I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about how it does it. Uh, th first, thanks for um, having me. So uh, my job got easier at Shift Rapidix. We work on merging AI and RNA too. And we'll talk a bit about what we do there. But my job got easier with these COVID vaccines because now my neighbor, when they ask what do you do, then I can start with, well, you know what RNA are now, so I can start with that. But just to do a biology 101 for everyone, so your cell are composed of DNA. That's kind of the OS code of your computer that defines what you do. And then out of that, there's those RNA that are made from the genes that are called messenger RNA. They're essentially the software that codes for a protein, and the protein is the function of the cell. So the mRNA was, uh, was postulated in 1960 by uh, uh, Crick and then Watson confirmed the existence of uh, mRNA in 1961. So it goes a long time ago, you know. So, so that's, the, that's the gist of it. And RNA are composed of four ribonucleotide, you know, instead of DNA, ATCG, it's AUCG. And four little letter codes for everything that happens in your life, the good stuff and also the bad stuff. I'm gonna ask you to go a bit further and let's use the uh, mRNA vaccine that we're all familiar with and, and many of us, uh, present company included, actually have uh, coursing around our bodies. Talk about how you print one of those up and put it in the body and then what it does in the cell. Yeah, that, that also goes way back. Uh, that was developed at Harvard, I think in, oh, blanking on the date, I think 19, mid-1980, where a team discovered that you can synthesize RNA using enzymes. So they took enzymes from bacteria, RNA polymerase, and they started cold coding from DNA to make RNA. So today there's a few ways to make RNA, but the, the most efficient way is still to use enzymes to make RNA to produce long enough code. But you could also synthetically use chemistry to make RNA, but that's a bit more laborious process and still a bit costly. Uh, but in recent age, we've been able to print DNA and read DNA more efficiently. Like the whole human genome ended up costing uh, a billion dollar to make. Now today you could get your genome sequence for a thousand dollars. So that's a hundred million price reduction. Without being able to read and write DNA, we couldn't produce RNA. So you have to make DNA first, and you can make that on a, on a silicone wafer chip like you, you design computer chip. But, uh, and from there, you can use enzyme to produce RNA out of these DNA uh, chunk. Uh, Jane, I want to go to you. Um, you know, uh, mRNA as a technology really burst into public consciousness, uh, or at least my consciousness, during the <laughs> pandemic. And, uh, you know, it, it had this really really kind of dramatic narrative, right, where some two days after the uh, Chinese sequenced the coronavirus, uh, the mRNA vaccine was designed, and then it, it sped through the vaccine trials faster than any jab in history. But that narrative sort of, you know, we heard Francois talking about the 1980s, mm -hmm. you know. Um, that narrative can sort of lead us to believe that this technology came out of nowhere. Tell us a little bit about the fits and starts along the way. 
Yeah, so um, Francois can probably tell you much better, but mRNA um, and RNA just degrades in your body very quickly. So it also has an innate immunogenicity associated with it. So there were some challenges with mRNA itself. Um, and then there's a lot of research that's been done on actually delivery systems, lipids, polymers, et cetera. And without those two things together, we would not have had a vaccine. Um, so you really need those two pieces. A lot of uh, work done in the 90s, early 2000s in delivery systems itself. And uh, we were able to build on that. So our first partnership with BioNTech was actually in 2018, before the pandemic, and we were partnered in flu vaccines, of course. Uh, talk a little bit about that delivery system. You, you said lipid, and I understand yeah. that's like a little bubble of fat. Yeah. How does it work? Why is that the best delivery system? Well, uh, there's been a lot of study on it, of course, but you essentially need something to um, encapsulate the mRNA so that it doesn't degrade as quickly in your body, and that could be delivered safely in your body, and with vaccines, of course, you have a systemic response um, so that it can, you know, essentially be, be translated and go to the cells that actually need to make the antigen that you've encoded the mRNA with. So it's, like I said, it's, it's a really important system together. Um, you cannot have one without the delivery system to be able to have it work in your body. Okay, if I could expand on yeah. that. So I worked for a company in the past called Genotherapeutics. I've been in the CAR-T space. I'm a molecular biologist, but I know my immunology pretty good. So a key point that people don't know is if you put mRNA in, in people, the immune system will react to it. It will see it as foreign. You know, there's a whole set of, you know, protein in your cell that marks your RNA to, so that you know it's a human RNA. And this was built so that you would be protected against viral RNA. Mm -hmm. So in the story of using RNA to deliver it to people, if you just put RNA in people, not like, mm -hmm. like she said, you know, it gets degraded, but it also triggers the immune response, a total like receptor that will wipe it out. It thinks you have a viral infection. So a big breakthrough was in 2005 when uh, chemistry was, you know, base of uracil was modified so that you could make it a bit more stealth in the immune system. Uh, but even without the uh, LNP, uh, lipo nanoparticle, and most of it was uh, discovered in Vancouver, the, the, the version that we have today, you wouldn't be able to deliver that RNA in the right cells. So having a good RNA is not enough. You need to put it in the right cells, and depending on the application, even LNP are not good enough. So it depends what you're trying to do. A lot of continued research in this area, essentially. Uh, well, as I was saying, most of us know mRNA from COVID, but uh, now that the technology has been proved on truly a global scale, uh, there are a lot of exciting potential applications for it that I want to kind of tick through. Uh, the first one is malaria, which um, is a sort of uh, obviously a huge killer, kills some 400,000 people every single year, most of them children, and has been notoriously impervious to vaccines. Okay. Jane, talk a little bit about why mRNA might be might have some success where other vaccines have failed against malaria. Sure. Um, so I think it's important to note that when you come up with a good vaccine, there's there's really two areas that you need. You need the actual vaccine technology itself, but you need to understand the disease biology as well. So I mean, the reason why we don't have an MR, uh, a mRNA or a malaria vaccine today is not because of the vaccine technology is lacking. It's just that is a very difficult pathogen to try to protect against, as we've seen. First uh, vaccine being only 50% protective, which is better than nothing, but um, a lot of continued research is going to have to be in this area. So again, you need to understand the vaccine delivery technology potential itself, but then you also need to um, have the disease biology and knowledge of that, and that's where a lot of science will need to progress in those two areas as well. Francois, can you say a little bit about why malaria is such a tough target? I mean, there's a, a whole class of infectious diseases that are quite challenging. Uh, I'll, I'll pivot your question somewhere else, but if you look at HIV, for example, or RPs, you know, uh, HPV can cause head and neck cancer, and once you have that, there's not a whole lot you can do about it. These viruses, uh, retrovirus class, they hide in your body and they stay dormant for years, so your immune system is unable to recognize. Everything comes down to can your immune system knows that you have a problem. As we speak, most people here have about eight cancer cells in them, and your immune system will flag them as you know, defective and will destroy them. As you get older, your immune system is not as good as doing with that, and cancer can take over. Or you could be born with a mutation, you know, for example, uh, people that are carrier for BRCA1 or BRCA2 mutation are predisposed to breast cancer. Uh, your immune system doesn't know this is abnormal, so you can't tell that that mutation is bad. So in the case of malaria, it's a bit the problem is, you know, these viruses hide, and it's also how they get transmitted. Right? You don't, I'm from Quebec. There's not a whole lot of malaria happening up there. 
something called winter takes care of it. You know, it's the ultimate vaccine against a mosquito mm -hmm. that carries malaria. So the other problem becomes, you know, treating a disease in third world country, right? And there's a cost associated to that and the benefit, financially or not, incentivized properly. And this is where the Gates Foundation comes in and helps with that. I mean, one area to look at would be flu vaccines. So flu vaccines, uh, flu viruses themselves, really well characterized, really well studied. And as you probably already know, there's been a search for universal vaccines in flu for decades now, and it's been really difficult. Um, you can put a protein and, and create an antigen, but if it's not protective, it's not a good vaccine. And that's part of the challenge with some of these other very difficult targets. Uh, let's stick with the flu for a second. Uh, you know, a couple years ago, I was at Princeton's Institute for Advanced Studies, and I saw a talk um, uh, by a young woman who was using AI to actually predict the next mutations uh, for the flu virus, some machine learning hookup. And uh, Francois, I know that at SHAPE, you all are thinking a lot about how AI and mRNA can be used together. Talk a little bit about how those technologies can work in tandem, whether it's against the flu or other infectious diseases. There's a no quote on artificial intelligence. I, I can't remember who said it, but it was maybe we should try to understand real intelligence before we uh, <laughs> understand artificial intelligence. That's a shape we do a lot of machine learning and AI. Uh, our thesis was RNA is for ribonucleotide. So technically, if you're making, let's say, a hundred long R piece of RNA, why not make every permutation? And the problem with that is that would be four to the power 100, and that's more than the number of atoms in the observable universe. So you can't make it. You know, it's too big to make it all. But if you could, and this is where machine learning comes in. You go as big as you can and synthesize massive library of RNA and you use AI to close the gap. Same with virology. We've been evolving virus for gene therapy at SHAPE. We've made libraries of hundreds of billions of AVs. We're trying to make virus that can go specifically to your brain, to your heart, to your liver, and so on, to deliver a specific RNA payload to, for genetic disorder. Um, so the way we use EIs and RNA and virology is essentially you make these massive screen, then, then you see if there's patterns in your winners uh, that came out of your screens. Uh, in the case of flu, there's two journey that people are trying to do. One is fine broadly neutralizing, you know, antibody for flu, and that will lead into broadly neutralizing mRNA that, you know, helps your body make these antibody against flu. And also, yeah, predicting what's coming next. Esther has shown we're really bad at predicting what's coming next, you know. Turns out it's hard to make sense of 500 million years of viral evolution and, and, and life science. Uh, but there, there are patterns, you know, you'll find patterns. Where is it from? Where does it tend to, to, to emerge from? And, and, and there's a logic in also the, how virus evolves through time. But you're always at the mercy of one mutation that could kind of mess up your, your whole system. So the key with AI and life science is you, you're only as good as your training set. And, you're only, and your training set is only as good as, you know, how big your input library was and your screening model is. Uh, so, so it's still going to be a long journey for flu. Flu is quite unique. It barely changed enough every year. It's almost the same virus every year. It barely changed enough to trick human system to take its company new viruses. Mm -hmm. And somehow we got such a hard time to, to deal with it. Even in the uh, mRNA uh, vaccine space, you know, COVID was a shocker how good it was. Yet some of the data on using mRNA vaccine for, for flu was good, but not as good as the you know, classic uh, flu vaccine. And I think that's going to shift. We just have still a lot to understand about flu to make this work uh, better. I think it's important to remember that um, viruses are, are organisms at the end of the day, and they are trying to survive. So the mutations help them uh, survive and then transmit to newer hosts and, and mutate again. So um, we have to understand that, that is, it's in their best interest to continue doing this. So of course, you know, the, the promise of AI is that maybe we can get ahead of it. Even moving away from viruses, uh, mRNA technology, uh, even before this big COVID explosion, has thought to be really promising in treating cancer. And the way it works is actually really exciting. It's that you actually sample the tumor tissue, and then you, you basically make, a, it teaches the mRNA vaccine is, that's specific to this tumor tissue, teaches your body to go seek and destroy all the other tumor cells. Uh, and that's just one treatment in this area. I'd love to know a little bit more about other ways it's being used, and then also how far away from this kind of thing are we? Like, when are our actual sort of ordinary patients going to have mRNA used uh, against their tumors? Yeah, so in oncology, there's, there's two applications. There's the, the antigen approach, which you mentioned, and there's two really promising areas of research in this. This is a personalized cancer vaccine, I think we've all read about, and then, of course, also potentially a shared um, antigen or shared uh, tumor <clears throat> approach for making a vaccine. So 
Um, yes, the idea is that you are able to take it and then create um, a vaccine that will help uh, pr create an immune response against the, those cells. The other way, actually, though, is through cell reprogramming, which is also a really interesting way of thinking about mRNA, because as Francois mentioned, is, at the end of the day, it, it tells your cells to make a certain protein. Um, so if you can actually tell your cells to make something that will then go attack cancer cells, uh, that's obviously very, very promising. Um, it's a lot of interesting research. It's changing every single day. Um, I think I, like the rest of the world, are really anxious to see how that is going to evolve. And you do hope that some of the research that's been done in mRNA maybe help accelerate some of this, these research efforts. Um, but uh, it's still too early to say when we're actually going to get that first vaccine out. So she can't speculate because she's from Pfizer, but I can. <laughs> so. Uh, can cancer is hard. Uh, cancer is really hard because when you think about it, the cancer is unique to you. You're going to have your own mutation. Uh, so you could think of it as an orphan disease, right? And that involves a whole lot of complication to go to the FDA and say, hey, I want to treat that person for what's unique to them. The, the, the main value of cancer vaccine is the idea that I could sequence you, I could sequence your tumor and see exactly what are the mutations that you have for you. And then out of that, I can make RNA that codes for these mutated protein. And the hope is that if I put more of these protein you already have in you, then you mount an immune response and hopefully that helps you fight your cancer. The catch to that is your, your cells are already presenting this antigen. So, so the jury's still out, you know, is making the mRNA make more of it going to make a difference or move the needle or not. So that, that's unknown. But this morning, uh, Merck and Moderna uh, uh, had a press release. We, we haven't seen the data, but the press release says that in combination with an antibody against PD-1 called Keytruda, uh, with an mRNA vaccine against uh, uh, skin melanoma, uh, they saw a, a massive increase in uh, uh, remission rates and, uh, and lack of relapse and death. So it's pretty hopeful. And I've worked with the folks at BioNTech historically, and I've worked with uh, the folks at Pfizer, so, so I'm sure there's a great thing coming. But don't expect, you know, your cancer will be treated next year. And, and not every cancer will be a one-size-fits-all. I think the mRNA technology will work really good for some cancer and not other, the same way we see CAR-T very, being very dominant in lymphoma and leukemia, but having a hard time getting solid tumor. Uh, ultimately, uh, prevention is the key. If you could catch up cancer at phase one, you know, you could probably treat most of them. We've mostly been talking about how wonderful this technology is, and I want to talk a little bit about the risks. I was wondering if you could sort of surface for us anything that's specific to this technology that's actually risky for the body. And even I, I kind of wonder if, if maybe if we start sort of over-programming the immune system that it, it may somehow become more brittle. Is a worry like that war warranted? I mean, I'll let the scientists answer that. <laughs> I mean, you could see it two ways. Like, uh, I'm a firm believer everything is good uh, in moderation. Like, a glass of water is refreshing. An ocean will draw on you. So, uh, yeah, there's such thing as putting too much. If you put too much RNA, uh, you know, even that discovery that pseudomethyluracil made RNA possible for a vaccine was a breakthrough. Otherwise, these COVID vaccines wouldn't work, right? And that was in 2005. Uh, Weisman and uh, Carrico that did that. And this should be part of the Nobel if there's ever one about it. Uh, they should share that Nobel on vaccines. Uh, the, the, uh, if you put too much RNA, you trigger immune sensing pathway. If you put too much RNA with chemistry, chemistry are toxic. So there's always a dose efficiency, and that's the game in every drug and every therapy. Too much of something might kill you. Uh, just enough might, might do the trick. And then the delivery vehicle, these liposome, I mean, they, you know, they're, they're, they're chemical component of by a layer of fat, right, with chemistry on it. So again, too much of it is bad. So something people don't know, when you put an LNP into someone, they go 99% of your liver, you know? So it works for vaccine, they infect enough cell, they go liver, you produce the antigen, but it's a limitation for the application of, uh, of uh, RNA technology, because you, you might need them in the brain because you're trying to go after Parkinson's, for example, or something like that. So, yes, you can over-engineer the immune system. You can, the, even in classic vaccination, uh, you could have a flu vaccine that makes you really good at making an antibody, and, and the virus might evolve away from it, and now your body is going to keep making the wrong antibody against the wrong strain, and the immune, the immune system, the virus can use that as an escape evasion to make people sick. And I think we're seeing a bit of that with COVID, with these Omicron variant, uh, sadly, uh, but we'll... It's still human on the planet, so I think we're, we're, we're looking good. And I think it's also important to remember, though, I mean, mRNA is in the spotlight right now. Um, there are limitations for all 
pharmaceutical biological products as well. So I think we have to keep that in the balance. Uh, I want to take audience questions in a minute here, but before I do that, uh, I want to monopolize you uh, just one more time. Um, I, you know, when we think about pandemic preparedness, uh, making sure that what happened in 2020 never happens again and we don't have a huge stoppage in our world, uh, one of the things that, that really strikes me and that in talking to people who are in this field is that there are 26 families of human virus, of viruses that affect humans. And coronaviruses are only one of them. And they're one that we actually knew quite a lot about. Like there had been all this work done previously to identify the fact that the spike protein is the thing that you want to target in a vaccine, which is why we were able to, to print up these, these new ones so quickly. And so a lot of people think we should sort of launch in on a kind of an Apollo style program in order to kind of build some opposition research uh, on the other 25 families. And I'm just wondering, you know, uh, mRNA as a platform, how it might be useful in that process. Yeah. So. Um what we've discovered with mRNA, given the speed that it's been able to help address and, and respond to the coronavirus pandemic, is um, it's very flexible. So at the end of the day, it's a production process that you can use for other vaccines, other therapeutics, and, and it makes it a little bit uh, special that way in that you don't have to have a totally new separate process for every new product that comes out. So the flexibility is really important. Um, the speed and the scale also. So if you're looking at mRNA manufacturing techniques um, and processes, it's, again, um, easier to scale, which is why we've been able to create the billions of doses of capacity globally as we have. So if we look toward um, future pandemics, you know, unfortunately, we're not going to be safe from them. We, we are biological <laughs> beings. And uh, again, as, as we mentioned, the viruses and other pathogens are organisms that are going to continue to find hosts and continue to find ways to, to, to sustain themselves. Um, but I think now that we have this technology itself, we are much better equipped to handle a future pandemic with speed, which of course is really of the essence, um, and as, as you know, preventing lockdowns and, and making sure that our lives can get back to normal. Um, one of the things that I've been talking about with various governments lately is what you really want is a pandemic response that people leave it and say, hmm, that wasn't so bad. That's really what we want to work toward. We're not there yet. <laughs> Uh, if I may, I, I think the most exciting thing about mRNA, if I can just ju jump topic and shameless plug my, my company, uh, <laughs> is actually not the vaccine. I think, you know, without mRNA, we could have still mean vaccine against COVID, right? So, so what we've been busy doing at SHIP is, you know, what else could you do with mRNA? Uh, you know, as I said at the beginning, you're, you're made of DNA, you make RNA. So if you carry a mutation that causes a disease, you know, could you fix it through mRNA or DNA biology? And everybody has heard of CRISPR by now. Uh, but the analogy, I'll use one of the computer. So when your laptop words, you know, document breaks down, you don't go to Apple to change the CPU, right? You do a software update. So you could think of playing with DNA would be, you know, changing your CPU, where updating the RNA would be the software update. So what we've been doing is seeing if we could apply RNA to fix or cause mutation in the transcriptome. So I'll give you an example. In Parkinson's disease, there's a mutation in a gene called ERK2 that causes familial Parkinson's disease. It's very severe, very, very young. So this one mutation in that gene that caused that disease. So the idea was, can I send an RNA in, in, the, in the neurons of your, your brain so that I could fix that mutation. And now you're making normal LERC2 gene, and therefore you'd be prevented to have uh, Parkinson's disorder. So we started looking at all kinds of genetic disorders. There's about 20,000 known genetic disorders. So for each of them, you could essentially fix them at the DNA level, RNA, or protein level. So we're busy making these small RNA to try to send them to the right cell type to try to do that software patch to fix all these genetic disorders. And we did a big partnership with Roche where we're, we're trying to chase Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and a few other diseases where we're going to try to update that code to try to help patients. Uh, there's a whole lot of challenge with it. So the difference is the biology is really well defined. You have mutation X, you have disease Y, right? So it's fix it or don't. The, the issue is you've got to put the RNA in the right cells, yeah. right? If I deliver my RNA in the liver of someone, that doesn't help their Parkinson's really much. So we've been building these class of viruses to try to get them to the right tissue type. You know, if you could give a sample IV to someone and the virus would then uh, introduce the RNA just in the right cell type, then you'd have a shot at, you know, curing these diseases. So we're trying to cure Alzheimer because the cost of Alzheimer in, in just in the U.S. is estimated it's going to be $1.7 trillion in the next decade. I mean, this will bankrupt the economy if we don't find a cure to Alzheimer so fast. Uh, so, so we have to do something about that. And RNA has potential to do that. 
Okay, uh, questions from the audience. We've got uh, microphones coming out. We've got one in the back right here, the, the gentleman in the hat. Hi, as, as we start to think about modifying uh, our programming basically, how might that affect our evolution, our ability to have a diverse population and sort of accommodate things in the future that we might not expect? Are you, are you talking about more like immunology against infectious disease or are you talking gene engineering? You know, gene engineering. Making so the people idea that, that taller, we, small, smarter, everybody blue eyes. I just yeah, disqualify myself. Not, not eugenics particularly, but just yeah. the idea that we try to do good, but in the process, there may be hidden costs to that. Yeah, history has shown that we're really bad at introducing stuff uh, across the world, uh, so there will be some consequence to that. But I, I think the key is to get ahead of it at the policy level. You know, I was in George Church Lab at Harvard Medical School in the early days of sequencing. I did my postdoc there, and even back then, George was telling about one day someone will engineer the human genome, right? Even before CRISPR was starting being used, and people were kind of, you know, not having this conversation. The whole case was, it's going to happen. If someone can think it, it will happen. So let's get ahead of it with policy. So there was an interesting case in China uh, about two years ago where someone made uh, two uh, babies that are knockout for CCR5. If you don't have a gene CCR5, you're uh, immune to uh, HIV. Right. HIV can infect your cell. Uh, they discover some consequence. One of it, that they claim the kids are smarter. Uh, that's good, but that was unexpected. Uh, and we don't know. Maybe uh, when they hit 30 years old, they'll have the most horrible form of lung cancer. Who knows, right? So there's so little we know about the human genome still today that you have to be very careful about mutating the, the, the genome. What we're working on with most of the our pharma partner is a bit easier, right? Like cystic fibrosis, there's known defined mutation, and you get a whole set of population that don't have mutation. So you know that is the problem. Uh, but if you start like boosting, you know, people just because you think it's going to help a case, there will be consequence to that, and we should be very careful about that. Francois, Jane, we're out of time. Thanks oh. for being with us today. Okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. And now, a conversation on the science of living longer. Please welcome Celine Hollywa, CEO of Loyal, with Andrea Valdez, Managing Editor, The Atlantic. Hello. Hi. Hi, everybody. Everybody learning a lot today? All right. Celine, thank you so much for being here. I'm really excited about this conversation. I think it's going to be a good one. First, I thought you could tell us a little bit about Loyal. So what's your company? What do you do for the people who might not know? Yeah, so my name is Celine Hollywell. I'm the founder and CEO of Loyal, or Cellular Longevity. And we're developing the first ever drugs intended to explicitly extend lifespan and health span, so the number of years that something lives and the quality of those years in dogs. Uh, we're really excited about that, but also more broadly, our goal is to take what we learn in dogs and translate that into people to hopefully help all of us live longer, healthier lives, too. So why dogs? Well, besides the fact that dogs are incredibly cute, and it's pretty consensus that extending dog lifespan would be great for the universe, great for social dynamics, great for basically everything. Everybody wants a dog to live longer. Exactly, exactly. Maybe not the, the like really angry small dogs, but <laughs> the middle-sized dogs were good. Um, dogs are, so I, I, I come from a human biotechnology background, and I was working on developing, working on the science of longevity in people, and I became pretty frustrated because there's a lot of people who are very interested in developing aging drugs for people, but you can't actually today test or commercialize or even study whether a drug explicitly extends lifespan or health span in people just because it takes a really long time. If I gave you an aging drug today, it would take decades for me to know if it did or didn't extend your lifespan, which sounds great, but like good luck funding that study, right? Um, and so I was trying to figure out, like, how can you develop a drug explicitly for lifespan extension in a period of time that would be relevant to an organization, feasible from a clinical study? Um, and dogs became kind of the obvious way to go about that. Uh, but also more interestingly, oh, but, sorry. but wait, so I mean, you say obvious, but I feel like we might think primates or something might be more obvious. Why are dogs more obvious than, say, something that feels a little closer to us? 
Yeah, so we have this really unique uh, relationship with dogs where we co-evolved with them, we shared an environment with them for tens of thousands of years, and dogs are actually one of the best models of human aging. So dogs develop the same age-related disease as we do at approximately the same time in their lifespan, the big exception being cardiac disease because there is not yet doggy McDonald's, um, a probably billion dollar opportunity if somebody wants to go after that. Uh, and so that means because a dog will develop uh, cancer, for example, naturally, if you're able to cure or treat or delay that cancer in that dog, it's not a one-to-one -to, -one to being relevant to people, but it's much, more it's much more biologically relevant than curing cancer in mice, which we've done many, many times. Um, it's also the second largest medical market behind people, which is important because we're a venture-backed startup. We've raised about $60 million. The whole you know, narrative that I'm telling investors, which I, I believe is true, is that by develop there's a billion-dollar company we've built in dog aging drugs, and then we can expand that out hopefully to people too, but that's only possible because there's a large market of crazy dog people, including myself, <laughs> who want their dogs to live longer, healthier lives. So it helps fund this research in a, in a way that is uh, much more capitalized than if we are in, you know, purely in traditional academia, for example. So then how do you get dogs in these studies? I'm just curious. Do you just go to regular pet owners <laughs> and ask them? Are people clamoring, beating your door oh, down? Oh, yeah. I get dog photos every day in my inbox. Like, and the minute I say what I'm doing, it's like the next sentence is always, why not cats? Um, and let so, me show you a photo of my dog. <laughs> okay, so let's answer that first question. Why not cats? Well, have you ever tried to give a cat a pill? Yeah. <laughs> And also, they live a really long time, so cats can live 15, 20 years. Um, and also, so we have this huge diversity of dog breeds. You'll have, you know, little, like, angry, yippy chihuahuas, and then the, like, ditzy poodles, and then the protective Rottweilers, and the Great Danes, and the German Shepherds. And this diversity is very, very interesting when you're a biologist, because you have each uh, dog has specific things that drive their aging. Um, a Great Dane might only live six to nine years. A Chihuahua will live 16 to 18 years. I mean, this is really interesting because then you're wondering, okay, why does that dog live such a shorter life? When generally speaking, when you look across the phylogeny, that bigger animals actually often live longer. Um, so it kind of gives you like a toehold into a very, very hard problem, which is how do you target aging? So talk a little bit about, I think people hear the word longevity or they hear live longer and they begin to conflate it with immortality. So talk a little bit, are, are you, you know, trying to cure death or is aging a disease? I mean, I bet these no. are the questions, okay. I bet these are the questions you get though. So, so talk a little bit about the difference between longevity and immortality. Yeah, so longevity is interesting. It's, um, depending how you look at it, it has either the best or worst branding for an actually incredibly boring idea which is preventative medicine for multiple diseases at the same time. And we already do this, right? Um, a statin uh, is a drug that you take to reduce your risk of certain future cardiac-related mortality events. Um, an aging drug, if it is successful and if we're able to build it in the way that my team's trying to build it and the way many people in the industry are trying to build it, it's just a pill or a drug that you take to reduce your risk of multiple age-related diseases at the same time, which, like, Sounds cool, but it's not as like nearly as sexy as immortality and thousand year lifespans, which is probably why most people don't talk about it that way. Um, but I'm personally not super interested in mortal immortality. Like I'm really more interested in how do we, I got really interested in aging because it to me feels like age related diseases and illness kind of takes away your free will to do the things that you want to do with your life. And how can you Im improve free will to have your biology and your body not hold you back from whatever you want to do. And I think that's a much more worthy problem than I don't know, trying to live forever. So did you have some sort of experience or something that really, you know, catalyzed your interest in this? I mean, you just said you got in, into this because you were interested in those questions, but was there an experience or someone you know or? Yeah, so I, so it was kind of twofold. I got, so I actually got into college or art school um, and then switched to neuroscience because I started a neuro-oncology clinic. And when, when you're, so I was a kid, um, when you're a kid, you always think the adults can fix everything in the room, right? Like if something goes wrong, they can help you because they magically know everything. Um, unfortunately, I've now learned that it's not true, um, that we don't know everything even when we are grown up. But I went and did an, um, uh, an internship at a neuro-oncology clinic, and I met a number of patients who were given you know, the worst diagnoses of their life. Um, they were often diagnosed as glioblastoma, for example, which is a very severe form of brain cancer that's very hard to treat. And it just seemed crazy to me that the person sitting in front of me 
you know, who wants to be there for their child's wedding or, you know, see their grandkid go to elementary school was not going to be able to do that just because some of their cells rebelled. And so I switched to neuroscience because I was like, I want to work on like that. That just seemed like an unacceptable way, like thing to occur. Um, so I decided to switch to neuro and then I got interested in aging because I was working on um, neuro-oncology and different neurodegenerative disorders. And like, for example, Parkinson's, which is a, an age related, um, brain disorder where you lose the ability to move or become like very tremory. It's due to a loss of a certain type of neuron in your brain called dopaminergic neurons. And so we were working in a lab trying to replace those neurons. And I remember sitting in this lab at like midnight or something and just like looking at the cells in front of me and wondering like, this is such a hard problem to try to replace these cells, to have them graft into the brain, to have them not have a, you know, a bad reaction, to have them turn into the specific type of neuron that you need them to have, and then have them synapse out into where they need to be in the brain to have the activity you wanted. And I was like, why are we trying to do this? Why aren't we just trying to prevent this person, just <laughs> trying to prevent this person from developing a disease instead? So that's how I got interested in aging, um, and it kind of all snowballed from, from there into dog longevity. So what are some of the stronger findings or the hypotheses that you're having kind of in these studies with dogs? I mean, what, what is it you're finding? How can we do this preventative work? Yeah, so we, we have two drugs. Um, and the, I, the company was founded around this idea of what I mentioned earlier, which is the fact that big dogs have shorter lives. So again, you see this 2x lifespan differential in the largest breeds like Great Danes and the smallest breeds like Chihuahuas. And that's super weird. <laughs> like we, tall people don't live massively shorter lives than short people. It's, it's a artifact of uh, canine inbreeding. So, you know, we had these like hybrid wolf uh, domesticated dogs when we domesticated dogs tens of thousands of years ago. It's not like we domesticated the wolf and a chihuahua popped out, right? We created these breeds ourselves and we all know this. We all know each dog breed has uh, genetically associated diseases. Uh, my Roddy has hip dysplasia. That's very common in those dogs. Uh, golden retrievers will often get certain forms of cancer. Bradycephalic dogs, the dogs with flat faces, struggle to breathe. And so the thesis of Loyal is that the fact that these big dogs live short lifespans is not just inherent, it's not just the way biology is, but it's actually a genetically associated disease that we gave these dogs when we were selectively breeding dogs for size. And this makes sense, right? Because the hand of evolution or directed evolution in the case of what we did to dogs, doesn't care about the end stage. It cares about the health of the dog until it gets bred again for whatever phenotype it had. So people were breeding these dogs, they were big, they were often inbreeding them because people didn't understand genetics, and they weren't following out the dogs or even thinking that it mattered to follow out the dogs to realize that, oh, the genes that we were selecting for that made them big also made them age faster. Um, so we're trying to develop preventative medicines. I basically, at a very, very high level, um, big dogs seem to metabolically age at a faster rate, up to 2x faster. Uh, our drug reduces that rate of aging, or we believe it reduces that rate of aging um, to extend their lifespan. Um, and so we've been doing health span studies in dogs for the last few years. You can see biological aging in a dog in about six months. Um, and we can't talk like super specifically about the data yet, but I can say at a high level, um, actually hopefully in the next six months we can, um, but at a high level what I can say is we've shown significant health span improvement um, in dogs treated with our drugs, both biologically, so around aging biomarkers, but also more importantly, functionally. So we look at a lot of functional markers of aging and functional markers of health, which is really relevant, um, A, for the animal, but also for pet parents who want their dogs to be healthier, bounding around uh, and more active longer. Well, tell me a little bit about I've read about how caloric restriction seems to be some sort of marker for how you know cellular um, aging is it can be prevented. So is that something that you're doing with the dogs? Are you working on calorie restricted diets? Is that something that can be translated to humans? So, you know, I know that intermittent, intermittent <laughs> fasting is nobody a huge wants deal. me to say yes to that. Well, <laughs> if it makes absolutely them longer, not, maybe. eat all the croissants. Uh, <laughs> No, so caloric restriction is actually the OG lifespan extension mechanism. The, as far as we know, kind of the first published longevity study was in the 1930s um, where they showed uh, lifespan extension in rats that were calorically restricted. And this has been replicated over and over and over again in mice, rats, C. elegans, yeast, primates, and dogs, actually. So like the only lifespan extension study that's been run to completion so far in dogs was in the late 1990s by Purina, ironically enough, uh, which is maybe why it doesn't go anywhere, where they showed that 25% caloric restriction uh, extended Labrador's lifespan about two years uh, compared to the placebo dogs and had a non-statistically significant but trend, uh, pretty strong trend towards a two-year delay in osteoarthritis 
osteoarthritis and cancer. And that's really interesting because cancer and osteoarthritis mechanistically are very unrelated diseases, yet they showed um, a, re a, a trend towards a reduction in both of those via the lifespan extended. And so it suggested that it was hitting some underlying rate of aging in these dogs. Um, so any, like, we're not developing the aging drugs you've heard of. We're not doing metformin for dogs. We're not doing rapamycin for dogs. But these drugs all hit around metabolic fitness pathways. And our second drug, which will actually, uh, if everything goes well, hopefully be our first drug on market, the idea of it is to uh, induce the uh, molecular behavior that you get when you calorically restrict uh, an animal to extend lifespan. So the dogs aren't losing weight. That's actually something we look at um, because people hate it when their dogs get skinnier. So the, do the drug does not cause a weight loss mechanism, but it does seem to, uh, in the studies we've done so far, uh, target the metabolic pathways that we believe uh, drive that lifespan extension that you, you see from caloric restriction. So what is the science behind that? Why is it like triggering some sort of response that the cells feel like they have to hold back? I don't know. I mean, look, I'm not a scientist, so I don't know, I don't know how to answer the question, but what is it about the caloric restriction that is, um, that's triggering that response, that, you know, longevity response? I mean, you could, there's a lot of different opinions on that. What we look at is metabolic fitness, um, insulin sensitivity, um, glucose release and uptake by the cells. Basically, the metabolic health of the, the animal is like the objective molecular markers. But then again, we also want to look at functional markers as they tie to them. So for example, we ran a 500 dog study. Um, actually, this was, at the, this was with the old dog rescue mutt fill I was telling you about yeah. because we, we were looking at a comparison between old and young, big and small dogs. So we wanted to show a correlation between different aging biomarkers. And one of the things that we showed, that's something that's like very well understood in humans, but had never previously been shown in dogs, we showed a, uh, a, a relationship between a reduction in metabolic fitness um, in that dog um, correlated with a reduction in an, objectively, uh, an objective measure of health span in that dog. So basically dogs that were less metabolically healthy also uh, often were, uh, had a lower health span as um, quantified by two different measures by which we look at that. And so that was really important, right? Because it's, you know, nobody really knows, like, are you extending lifespan because you're reducing the risk of cancer because you improve their metabolic fitness? Or is it because if you have improved metabolic fitness, you age slower? Like, nobody really knows, but we do know it's relevant. Um, and that's why we kind of are, like, towing in there first. So in all of your research and of all your studies, is there anything that you're seeing that you're taking away for yourself. I mean, yeah. no? Everyone always asks me this. Look, every longevity person I know either like pedals their shit like crazy, in which case you should probably like, I don't know, not follow it because I often think they're like very emotionally attached to like whatever like longevity messiah pill they found or they're like the least healthy people ever. <laughs> and I am definitely in the latter. Like I have like only had uh, coffee today. Um, I eat a lot of chocolate. Like I am not... Like a but longevity supposed messiah. to be good for you, right? Yeah. <laughs> but like I, I, my the thing I always say is like one, I believe that we will there will be aging drugs this decade that people can buy, and I think that's going to be more effective than any like me being unhealthy, which helps me work on the company longer, which helps me increase the probability that we'll have aging drugs is like probably net better for me. This is like how I convince myself. Um, and also because I actually try not to like make it about my own longevity. Like I think that's actually, so a lot of these people who were like peddling immortality a thousand year lifespans, they were doing it because they had a fear of mortality. Um, and I think it's really important to actually do it for the patients, do it for the pets, um, not do it for yourself because then you won't be able to make the objective decisions you need to make when you're looking at data. Like biology is like, biology is a total bitch. Like it just like will screw you over and like not work at the last minute. Um, and you can't be like emotionally tied to that. You have to be emotionally tied to the truth. That's interesting. So there's nothing that you've changed or that you would encourage others. I can't go and eat more vitamin E or a weird cocktail of various vitamins. I mean, vitamins. There's, there's all the basics. There's nothing that would like be unique to what I would say. Um, I, I don't take any, I don't take any drugs that are for longevity. Okay. That's fair. Um, I would also get in trouble with the FDA if I suggested anything. So, <laughs> okay. Also fair. Um, so the, the other big question I think people have around longevity is that there's already inequities in longevity. Yeah. We see that, you know, there's class disparity among people who live longer. Would longevity drugs potentially exacerbate those issues? Or I'm sure there's a lot of, a lot of thoughts, a lot of questions that come your way about that. I love this question because, and I love that actually we were at this conference, the progress summit on this, because I've always found it really interesting that 
the response to inequities or challenges in healthcare, especially, which to be clear, I know healthcare is extremely uh, fucked up. I, uh, before I started Loyal, I was studying the disparities in um, health economic access in, in England. And I was like, I, I still do, but especially back then, cared about a lot. Um, but I, I don't think current flaws in how our system works is a justification for not pushing forward progress in medicine and in understanding the biology of diseases and how to treat them, one, because um, that doesn't help anybody. Uh, but also specifically, when it comes to aging drugs, I actually think it'll, so the type of aging drugs I want to develop um, are cheap daily drugs that the majority of Americans and maybe one day people in the world take to reduce their risk of future age-related diseases. Um, so again, the statin metaphor is one I use often. Um, and this is something that, of course, will not be accessible to everyone, but theoretically would be accessible to many. And I think that's actually very important because the people who are most impacted by developing an age-related disease, by developing Parkinson's, by developing a cancer, are not people who are rich and who can fly themselves out to Mayo to get the brand new fancy treatment that's half a million dollars. Uh, it's the people who don't have money, who have to suffer to cover their premiums and they have a super high deductible plan. It's like 7,000 a year, which is a lot if you don't have a lot of money. It's a lot in general, but especially if you don't have a lot of money. And then the kids who have to take care of their parents and do home care because they can't afford a nurse to take care of them, to put them in a facility. And that then slows down progress and genera generational uh, growth for those people. Um, I mean, I, uh, but like before Obamacare, my, my, we didn't have the, I would say like the best health insurance access because my, my parents aren't American. And it was terrible. Like, it was extremely, extremely stressful. I still have a shitty credit score from, like, the medical debt I had, um, and uh, which makes getting an apartment very annoying. And it's, like, I think, I don't think aging drugs, nothing is the messiah, um, but I think if we can reduce our frailty to the diseases that hurt our population the most, it's only, it's only better um, for the world. Right, building in a resilience. Uh, well, I'm curious, and kind of related to that, do you, what about people who might suggest that longevity is going to be a tax on our earth and resources and could stress the environment in general? I mean, what's yeah. your response to that? Yeah, I mean, I think it depends, right? So I'm not working on drugs that would make people live 200. I think our drugs uh, will potentially extend lifespan. Um, you know, I, I, we're, we're aiming for basically noticeable benefit and especially noticeable health span benefit, but it's not. We're not making 50-year-old dogs. Uh, <laughs> sorry, maybe the next panelist can help with that, but leave out me. Uh, it's really, it's more about having a healthier, more productive life, which, I mean, one of the challenges of our society is going to be a, a population that's getting older and more and more unhealthy, and then it's my generation and or Gen Z, uh, who have to kind of shoulder that and take care of that and pay into a system to support them, versus what if they were able to be productive, or what if they were able to be cognitively flexible for longer, or what if they were able to take a second career and not be feeling like they can't because, you know, employer discrimination against people hiring people who are older. Um, again, I, I think there will be challenges if we start having people living until 200, but I don't think that's where we are right now. I think it's really more about how can we have people have longer healthier lives and the period of time they do have, maybe we add 10 or 20 years on average, um, being more productive for all of society. Uh, of course, we want to open it up to some audience questions. If anyone has audience questions, feel free. They're going to put some mics around. There's actually a gentleman up here in the front. Uh, once the mic comes around. Um, I can answer oh. that one while we're waiting. Um, do you want me to? Oh, great. Uh, yes, let's, let's say, uh, are there clinical trials, for, tr clinical trials for doggy pharmaceuticals? I love how that was phrased. That's why I wanted to answer it. Um, and yes, so we actually um, are aiming for our uh, pivotal study in dogs to hopefully show the, the lifespan and health span efficacy of our drugs starting in Q3 of next year. So if you have a dog and you're interested, you can actually go to our website and register your interest. Um, and yeah, it's held to the same standards as humans. It's double blind, placebo controlled, statistically powered to hopefully support our endpoint or not support our endpoint if our drug doesn't work. Um, and it's run in a uh, neutral way or uh, unbiased way by uh, veterinary professionals across the US. Great, thanks. And just before we get into Q&A's reminder, please have a question mark at the end of your comment. So uh, did, where did the mic go? <laughs> Uh, just this gentleman right here. I'm, 
I'm curious, have you, have you looked at therapeutic plasma exchange? There's been some really interesting papers, even in the last couple of months, about life extension using TP. Yeah, so we, we're, so the, there's a, when we were thinking about what drugs to develop, there's a number of different variables we were selecting by, and one of them was ease of use for the pet parent. And so uh, the, the first drug for big dog short lifespan is a, uh, depending where the CMC lands out, a three to six month dissolvable that they just, you know, get popped in like a microchip at the vet, um, and then just releases the drug from there. Uh, and any other is a daily pill. Uh, convenience and super low COGS are really, really important in pet health because it's cash pay. Um, so we, and if we want our drugs to be accessible to majority of pet parents, which we do, we don't want to have only rich dogs living longer, healthier lives. That'd be bad for a multitude of reasons. Uh, you can't really do things that are super complex. So like, for example, besides the fact that I think a lot of pet parents would probably struggle with that, um, it also would require a lot of technician time, which is expensive on an hourly basis. But the biology of that is really interesting. It's just not where we're going right now. Other questions? Uh, this gentleman right here in the front. So I was interested in your comment about functionality and my limited knowledge from just reading the health section of the New York Times. It's we're all going to live to about as long as we're going to live. That's in our bodies. It's in our DNA. But it's what our lives are going to be like during that time. Can you talk about corollaries between functionality in dogs and functionality in humans? Yeah, so one of the, I, I, func I so we, we want to translate what we're learning in dogs to people, and one of the things we're trying to figure out is exactly that, like what are objective measures of function that you can measure in a dog and also measure in a human, and it be uh, relevant to that pet parent, something they care about, but then also relevant to a human. So one of the things I'm super interested in is cognition, actually. Um, cognition changes a lot with age. Uh, actually, <laughs> uh, I, I don't know if I should make this joke, but uh, one of the things that declines the most with age is actually cognitive flexibility and the ability to relearn something. So I often make like a slightly uh, uncouth political joke that like maybe that explains our political system, that older people can't relearn things. But you actually see this in the dogs, right? You see this that the dogs can't, we, the way you test it is you uh, teach them to associate a certain tree, and these, these are like cognitively trained, so they've been like trained this way for a while, to associate a certain tree or a certain toy with a treat, so if they touch their nose to get the treat and then they have to relearn to actually touch this toy to get the treat and the dogs that are placebo not treated with anything uh, when they when it switches they'll just get pissed off um, and just like not like engage in the like study anymore and the dogs who are on our drug uh, were able to at a higher level like relearn so like realize that like that toy meant treat um, so there's a lot of things like that. We're looking at like stair tests, so like how well can they go up and how fast. Uh, the walking tests are a big one in people. Um, I like loosely, I'm not totally emotionally committed to this yet, but like I loosely think functional endpoints is where human aging drugs are going to go and that's something that we're trying to build out more of. Got time for one more question. Uh, over here. Um, how did you start, was it a pet that you had as a child that passed away um, that inspired you to start the business? So I'm a huge animal person, which I actually, thank you for asking this, because I never get to talk about this. Um, but I grew up with like 15 cats, four dogs, like, uh, like mice. Like we used to rescue animals in our, like we lived in like suburbia, Austin. We used to like rescue the animals we would find and like nurture them to health. There's a photo of me with a baby squirrel on my shoulder and a baby opossum that we rescued that we then brought to wildlife rescue. Uh, we didn't, you didn't like illegally house opossums or anything. Um, so I've always been a huge animal. I've been vegetarian my entire life. Like, that's always been a huge part of my life. Um, but it, I never thought, I, I wouldn't start a different dog company just because it, it's not the problems I want to wor work on. Um, and I didn't think I'd start a dog longevity company. I got interested in it because to me, it just felt like, I think when you're a founder, one of the things that's important is don't just start a company to start a company. You start a company that like you uniquely are one of the better people to start it. I don't think I'm uniquely the best person to start an Alzheimer's therapeutics company or a small molecule AI discovery company, but I did think I was one of the best people to work on the intersection of longevity, which I'd worked on for years, and dogs, because it's a, we didn't really talk about it that much, but there's a whole consumer aspect and a whole consumer education aspect of like how do we make science and progress not scary, but actually something that the average American is excited about and not politicized anymore. Uh, and I thought that was something that like, was an intersection where I could do well, um, and then finally, it also, the structure, the incentives are aligned, right? Because it's a cash pay market, um, 
because we're trying to, we need to build successful dog aging drugs to ever be able to go into humans, right? The revenue is actually super important. The long-term data is super important. Um, the long-term outcomes are super important. It meant that even if I turned super corporate and evil, we would still do the same thing we're doing. We would still be working on helping dogs live longer, healthier lives because it's economically incentivized in the structure of the company. And I thought that was really important given how shitty the incentives often are when you go into healthcare and biotech. All right. Thank you so much, Celine, and long live dogs. Thank you. Please welcome to the stage Chief Revenue Officer and Publisher at The Atlantic, Alice McCown. Hello, I'm Alice McCown, Publisher and Chief Revenue Officer of The Atlantic. I hope you enjoyed our morning conversations. I'd like to thank all of the speakers for these amazing discussions, really, really incredible, thought-provoking, so thank you. Um, now we are on to uh, breakout sessions and lunch, so a couple notes on that. For breakout sessions, um, upcoming we have two. In the screening room we have a conversation with AARP on the longevity economy and how creators, makers, and business leaders can better plan, design, and build to leverage their value and contributions. And right here on this stage we'll explore the business risks of climate change with PwC. After that we will go on to lunch and networking on the terrace. Immediately following lunch, we will go back into breakout sessions. So in the library, we'll be discussing drones and AI. In the screening room, a conversation and demonstration on how AI can revolution, revolutionary, revolutionize art and creativity. Um, and one thing before we depart, I want to remind everyone that we have um, incredible activations just in the back here, so please go and check those out. We have a 3D printer, an incredible uh, video booth. So please enjoy that, and we'll see you back here uh, after lunch and after our sessions. Enjoy. Thank you.
Now for a conversation produced by our underwriter, PwC, on the business risks of climate change, please welcome Debbie List, Head of Global Sustainability, Intuit. Amit Narayan, Founder and CEO, AutoGrid. Diana burkett Rakal, Senior Vice President of Public Affairs and Sustainability, Alaska Airlines. With Mohamed Kande, U.S. Vice Chair, Consulting Solutions Co-Leader and Global Advisory Leader, PwC. Hi, Debbie. Can you see us? No? We can see you. Can. Hi, everyone. So we have the uh, four uh, panelists with us today, and she's on video, so uh, she's going to participate. So thank you for being with us. To, to all of you in the audience, thank you for uh, joining us on this panel. My name is Mohamed Kande. I'm a vice chair with uh, PwC. I lead the, uh, the consulting solutions business. And uh, today we have a great panel, okay? And we are going to talk about climate climate risk. You know, when you think about climate risk and all the different events that we have with climate change, many organizations are thinking about what the impact that they have on the climate is. Looking at becoming carbon neutral, thinking about how to report about the carbon footprint. One of the conversations that we're now having with many of the companies that we work with is around what is the climate doing to corporations today? What is the climate risk? I'll give you an example. You all heard about the semiconductor industry. And the reason we hear about it, because semiconductors happen to be in cars, in appliances, in computers. In 2021, there was a drought in Taiwan. They ran out of water the largest producer of semiconductors in the world happens to be in Taiwan. All of the major supply chains get impacted. Cars, you know when you order a car and it takes a long time to get it because they run out of semiconductors. Same thing for washing machines, same thing for computers. So the world got surprised by the fact that the climate impact on corporations was real. And many of the corporations around the world did not anticipate all the supply chain shortages that we have been living for the past, uh, uh, I would even say for the past year. So today we are going to have this panel to talk not only about what corporations should do, like all of us should do when it comes to making sure that we take care of the climate, we take care of the planet, but also what are some of the climate risks do we need to manage? So I'm joined today on this panel by Amit Nawayanen, founder and CEO of AutoGrid, Debbie List, she's currently with us virtually, she's the head of global sustainability at Entrid, Diana Burkett Racco, I said it right, Senior Vice President Public Affairs and Sustainability at Alaska Airlines. So the first part of the question that we are going to have is going to be around reacting to today's risk, climate risk. Diana and Debbie, I will start with the two of you. Maybe with you first, Diana. How are you seeing the uptick in natural disasters currently impacting Alaska Airlines? And what are you doing today to mitigate the risk? Thanks, well, thanks, Mohammed, for hosting this important conversation. So for those of you that don't know Alaska Airlines, um, we're uh, the fifth largest airline in the United States. We have the largest operations, um, uh, or the largest airline on the West Coast. And we operate from the Arctic all the way down into um, Central America and Belize. And so there's a lot of different issues that come up throughout that geography. And then we operate out to Hawaii and um, to the East Coast. Canada, et cetera. But if you think about some of the things that are happening in Alaska, that's very different than sort of wildfires and heat waves um, in California, Oregon, and Washington. Um, and so there's sort of two things that we think about. One is preparing for um, changing weather and being prepared to respond. 
being prepared in our own operations, and the other one is being prepared to respond to the community around us. So I'll give you two um, examples. A couple of years ago, we had a massive heat wave in Seattle, um, our largest hub at, at SeaTac Airport. And, um, you know, it was 114 degrees, 120 degrees on the tarmac because it's hotter on the tarmac. And um, it's just a, it's a human issue, a very real human issue for our ramp workers that are out there um, loading airplanes. And so there's some very basic things that we put into place, like better fan operations and cooling and water delivery and um, things that are not highly technical but are really important for us to now know that that's something that we have to think about. Um, the other thing that we've been looking at, though, on the more technical side is how do we have really good a, weather prediction, and how do we also have really strong um, adaptation in our operation to weather patterns happening around the country? Um, and one of the things that we've done in the last couple of years is implemented uh, some machine learning and artificial intelligence powered software that our dispatchers use to plan flight routes. Um, they uh, will take in weather data, they take in data, for, the system takes in weather data, takes in uh, data from where airplanes are moving around the country and sort of adds that technological element to the dispatcher's thinking to help them optimize where an airplane should go, where an airplane should fly to um, get through weather patterns or go around weather patterns. But rather than thinking about the data static, it thinks about where the, where the storm system might be moving or how a storm system is changing. Um, we've saved this year about uh, 10,000 uh, metric tons of CO2 using that software, which is called Flyways, and it's continuing to grow and expand, um, sort of incubated in our uh, operation. The last thing that I'll just say, and I think is something for all of us to think about, is how do we not just adapt our own companies, but how can we be responsive and responsible for sort of communities around us? Um, one of our most recent, you know, certainly supporting wildfire uh, mitigation on the West Coast is a big one, um, but uh, a little bit farther afield from maybe our day to day, there was a massive typhoon on the West Coast of Alaska um, that really decimated a number of communities up there. And so actually, you know, we are the largest transportation infrastructure in the state of Alaska other than the ferry system. And so getting supplies out to different communities, medicine, et cetera, um, was a big part of uh, what we do. So lot, lots of different ways to think about it, but um, hopefully we're all thinking about how to continue to adapt. All right, thanks, Diana. And for the audience, I'm going to give you a few facts from Unsolved Global Risk and Impact Report. When you think about natural disasters, you know, that's the company that gives uh, amber alerts that we all, we all get, you know, when something happens uh, in society today. 28% year-over-year increase from, 2000, from 2020 to 2021, where global floods are becoming a major threat. Tornadoes are up 78%, and wildfires, 74%. That has a risk to not only corporations, but also to individuals right, that we have today. Debbie. What about you? How does you, know, you look, look at all this climate change, putting your, some of your uh, uh, customers at risk today? Yeah, thank you, Mohammed, um, And thank you again for hosting, as Diana said, this really important conversation. So Intuit is a global financial technology platform. We have over 17,000 employees worldwide. We serve over 100 million customers. And really like many software technology companies, Intuit doesn't face the same magnitude of physical risks from climate change as say a manufacturing company or an aviation company like Alaska Airlines. And so while our offices may have to contend with extreme weather events, we've built in efficiencies and redundancies like a distributed workforce, cloud computing, so we can continue to operate as business as usual with minimal disruption, yet as we zoom out beyond the four walls of our offices, we know that climate change is going to Im have massive impact on all of our stakeholders, from our employees to our customers, communities, like Diana mentioned, are becoming increasingly important, the communities we serve, and our shareholders. Um, and as, actually, as a company, We've made it very clear that our stakeholders aren't only our investors. In fact, we've doubled down on looking closely at how communities where we work, live, and serve our customers are impacted by the risks of climate change. And so we know in particular that marginalized and underserved communities are at an even greater risk. So we're looking for ways 
to help them prepare for the future. One example I'll give is we're investing in renewable energy projects in rural and low-income communities to not only make sure that they're more energy resilient um, and that they can reduce their own carbon emissions in their communities through renewable energy, but that there's also an economic impact to these projects within those communities and that too helps build resilience and help them become better prepared in the face of these climate risks. Um, and small businesses are a large percentage of our customers. And I'll just touch quickly on that since you mentioned some really um, important facts about natural disasters. So FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency here in the US, estimates that almost 40% of small businesses never reopen after a disaster, 40% of small businesses never reopen after a disaster. And we and the climate science shows us that the effects of a warming planet are only going to make things worse for us in a decade. And small businesses that lack a safety net are at risk of losing their ability to operate if they can't recover in the wake of a disaster. And I'll share more later about what we're doing as a company to help small businesses prepare for the risks that they face from climate change. But I, I'll, I'll end with this that um, similar to what Diana said, it's, you know, we believe it's the business community's responsibility to inspire change from all of our stakeholders to collectively mitigate climate change driven risks. Okay, to your point, uh, Debbie, you know, uh, first of all, thank you for sharing some of the stats. That actually is sobering 40% of small businesses don't reopen after a climate disaster. That's, uh, that's consequential, right? When you think about it. So you mentioned, you know, inspiring buying from the rest of the stakeholders that we uh, that we are managing today. Another uh, type of questions we are getting from a lot of the corporations who work with is really around technology. How do you use technology today to mitigate, you know, some of the impact of climate change? Right. So I think in the energy sector or even in the utility sector, you just have to look at California, right? With some of the wildfires that we have had. Think about Texas even flood in other parts of the country, right? How is business using technology or leveraging technology to mitigate the impact of climate change? I mean, I go to you now. Thank you, Mohamed, and thanks again for having me as part of this uh, panel and conversation. So uh, just briefly on AutoGrid, uh, we have been working uh, towards the singular mission of accelerating transition to sustainable energy for more than 10 years. And we provide a software AI-based platform that is used by both utilities uh, who are trying to deploy more renewables onto their grid uh, while maintaining reliability of the service, as well as uh, users of electricity uh, who are trying to decarbonize their operations and they want to do it in a cost-effective uh, manner uh, 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 without compromising uh, the level of service uh, that they're receiving. And, and a whole, whole set of uh, intermediaries, project developers, and so on. And uh, uh, more recently, earlier this year, uh, after proving our technology in over 17 countries and with more than uh, 6,000 megawatts of power, uh, we were acquired by Schneider Electric. So we are part of the global energy major, uh, and through them, we are now rapidly expanding and trying to deploy in more than 100 countries uh, that they operate. So what struck me about a decade ago when I started really diving into uh, this uh, area was the irony of fighting climate change. Because you mentioned all these uh, major uh, weather events which uh, wreak havoc on all the businesses and, and Primarily, one of the ways is that the power grid actually goes, goes down and people lose uh, uh, access to, to electricity. Now, the irony is that um, the most, uh, I would say, uh, scalable path that we have towards fighting uh, this climate change and reducing our carbon footprint is to deploy more and more renewable and, of course, convert uh, uses of, elect, uh, of energy into electricity, so transportation, heating, cooling, and so on. Now, the challenge is that when you actually move your supply to renewables, you actually end up adding more volatility to the system because now your supply is also weather dependent, and, it, uh, and, and, and uh, you need to now predict uh, how to, uh, I mean, when the, when the wind is going to blow and the sun doesn't shine all the time, right? So the way our grid is designed architecturally is that 
to manage the balance of supply and demand, you actually have to build even more fossil fuel-based standby generators. And even by fossil fuel standards, these generators are actually much more polluting and also very costly. And so we thought that uh, to solve this problem, we'll have to fundamentally change the architecture of the grid. And this is where AI comes in uh, by using all the different assets that are getting deployed. And often these are overlooked assets, things um, in your home, a thermostat in your home, or a battery in the garage, or even your EVs, uh, which are parked for most of the times. It has a lot of spare untapped capacity that can be used through intelligent algorithms uh, and can play a role in balancing the supply and demand. So that's what our software does. Uh, we call it a virtual power plant, uh, and it is uh, in pretty much every dimension you can imagine a superior product to these fossil fuel-based uh, peaker plants uh, that are used to manage the grid, and, uh, and, uh, and, and uh, uh, we are very excited by the adoption that we are seeing in uh, uh, pretty much across the globe at this point. Very interesting. Very interesting. Thank you, Amit. So, Diana, in, in the airline industry, and I quote, you have said, to adapt and grow in a change world, a world where, where we can anticipate higher temperatures, you will need to invest in technology that does not necessarily exist yet. Can you expand on this, please? Sure. So this is a, it's a hard problem in the aviation industry because we burn fuel for a living. And we believe that what we do delivers value, and we see that in very real ways, particularly in some of the more remote or rural communities um, that we serve. Just one fact that um, we were talking about back there, Alaska operates to um, 20 communities in the state of Alaska, and only three of them are accessible by road. So you, you might actually be able to argue that in uh, L.A., too. They're accessible by road. You just can't get anywhere on the roads. Um, and we do operate to a number of airports down here as well. In any case, we have to figure out some different ways um, to do what we do. And so we set a five-part path to net zero. The first part is operational efficiency, which is running as tight and as efficiently and as reliably as we can, which means avoiding fuel use in the first place. Um, the technology that I mentioned, flyways, is one part of that. There's some very um, sort of simple uh, things that we can also do, like running one engine when you're taxiing on a long runway instead of um, two, and then starting the second one as you get closer to takeoff. Um, the second part of the path is um, a new fleet. So up, uh, new airplanes have, and we have the youngest fleet in the U.S. industry, um, the airplanes that we're taking delivery of right now have about 25% um, or are 25% more fuel efficient on a seat-by-seat -seat basis than the ones that they are replacing. So that's a big step forward. But then you're still, okay, so you're still burning fuel in those airplanes. What do you do? So the third part is um, replacing the fuel where we can with what's called sustainable aviation fuel, which are essentially a series of fuels that are made um, by recycling carbon. And the carbon can come from a variety of different sources. Uh, but those fuels are, um, have a lot of potential and really the main um, potential for decarbonizing most of aviation in the future. Um, they only exist at about 1% of all fuel today, uh, but there, is, um, there are a lot of efforts underway, policy, private sector, um, to scale up that market. The fourth piece is electrifying aircraft. They're going to be much smaller aircraft and shorter haul. Uh, we're working with a company uh, called Zero Avia, um, who are working on retrofitting uh, smaller regional aircraft with uh, hydrogen electric powertrain technology. And then the last piece, which we were also talking about backstage, is in most, ca in, in, um, most scenarios, there will be a need for carbon, high quality carbon offsets or removals in order to get all the way to net zero um, in a hard to de sec decarbonize sector like ours. And so investing in those technologies in the future and making them better is really important. Um, and so for us, it's a combination of sort of understanding them, knowing where they're going, using them where we can, or partnering with others to do so, and I know we'll get to that in a little bit, and then trying to enable those. And we started a venture arm called Alaska Star Ventures to try to identify and do what we can to invest in these technologies to grow. Um, and I'm sure there's a lot of things that we can do across the folks in this conversation to enable some of those in the future. 
No, thank you very much, uh, Diana. So let's pivot the conversation to and talk about business to greater role in you know, making sure that it, uh, we can really drive real impact from both a purpose point of view, right? The purpose of making sure that we take care of the, you know, of the climate but, and of the planet, but also from the profit uh, point of view. Debbie, you mentioned, you mentioned about the fact that we need to make sure that we deliver impact beyond the four walls of an organization or a company, but also that we help our stakeholders, right? I mean, I come to you first, okay? When you think about the business community, responsibility to inspire the right change that we need to collectively mitigate the impact of climate change. I know that equity and environmental justice are fundamental to emission at Eurogrid. You alluded to it. How does that commitment translate into making real change? Sure, yeah, so first of all, uh, I think uh, when we are thinking about energy transition, I do think that the role of uh, communities and empowered consumers, we call them prosumers, uh, is central to, uh, uh, to our ability to actually move away from uh, fossil fuels. So, uh, so we, uh, we are working very hard to make it easy to match, as we call, good intentions with good incentives. So when people uh, who are eager to reduce their carbon footprint, a lot of them are producing energy, they want to share this with their community, give back to the grid, we make it easy for these uh, consumers to be able to participate in the, in the economy. And as you said, uh, Mohammed, what is good for the planet should be good for the prosumer's pocketbooks, and, uh, and we try to reduce that friction. Now, one of the things that we are doing, uh, and, and uh, where we think that there is actually a, a, a really win-win uh, on all sides of the equation, is that a lot of these speaker plants that are used to balance the grid are historically sited in the most vulnerable communities. And even by fossil, uh, if you look at one mile radius around uh, some of these worst polluting peaker plants, uh, uh, demographically, ethnically, these are, uh, and so, and, and these peaker plants are bad even by uh, fossil fuel standards, as I mentioned earlier. They, on an average, produce four times more emissions. Uh, they are 10 times more expensive. Uh, Ironically, they're not even very reliable because when a storm hits, the lines that carry the electrons go down if the plant itself is not, not down. So uh, it impacts uh, the most vulnerable communities in the, in the, in the worst way. So by replacing these uh, peaker plants, we are uh, not only reducing the impact of these plants, but by doing it through virtual power plants, we are able to take that investment and bring it back into the communities. So we make it easier for people to rent out their EV if it's not being used or make small adjustments to their consumption for which they can get paid. And all that investment actually goes back into buying more uh, microgrids or ba batteries and solar, which makes the communities more resilient, improves the uh, economic uh, condition uh, for, for people who are participating in these things. And it creates a flywheel effect. Because now, because we have reduced the cost, uh, more people can afford it, more resources come in. And, and the beauty of this whole thing is that, of course, the people who benefit uh, directly uh, by participating are winners. But because it brings the reliability of the overall system higher, and it actually reduces the cost for everyone, even if uh, somebody is not directly benefiting by participating in this uh, prosumer economy around energy, uh, uh, the whole society actually moves forward. This is great, thank you. Debbie, I come to you next, okay? So do you see small and medium businesses beginning to think or prepare for climate change? You know, the stats that you just gave us earlier are actually are quite amazing. And how, how is entry today helping to prepare, you know, the small and medium-sized businesses for the risk presented by climate change? I know you're starting to allude to it, but we'd love to, uh, to expand more. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll start with the first part of your question in terms of, you know, if we're seeing uh, SMB, small, medium sized businesses beginning to think or prepare for climate change. And um, we actually ran a survey of our own small business customers about a year ago and found that nearly all of them, so 97 percent, say that they want to take action to become more environmentally responsible. And yet more 
in-depth sessions that we've conducted with our small business customers, you know, so those using our products like QuickBooks and MailChimp are facing a myriad of challenges today, such as inflation, the rising cost of goods and services, and simply making payroll to the point that many of our customers don't see climate change as a present risk, or at least it's lower on the list of risks that they're facing. Um, and many of those customers, interestingly enough, expressed um, not even knowing where to start in preparing for the risks of climate change. And so armed with that insight, we want to, we continue to experiment to build climate offerings for our SMB customers to help them reduce their own carbon emissions and become more resilient in the face of these climate risks. Um, so a year ago, we launched the Climate Action Marketplace, the Intuit Climate Action Marketplace, to give any small business, not just our customers, instant access to sustainable solutions such as solar energy and food waste options that can easily replace their more carbon intensive operations. And so by making it easier for small businesses to make that switch, we can equip them to be part of the solution while also helping them build the resiliency into their own supply chains and operations. Um, and frankly, we've learned a ton over the last year since we launched the marketplace. Um, we've learned that it still remains tough for small businesses to prioritize climate action amongst all of those other challenges that I listed that they're that they're facing. Um, so you know we're working on piloting and building a next phase product that will help our, QuickBooks customers, our small business customers, understand their footprint and make decisions based off of that. Again, hopefully to help them become more resilient in the face of these climate risks. And I really see this space as ripe for innovation and creative solutions um, with small businesses comprising 90% of the business population globally and really making up the backbones of the communities that they're in, we see the need to be able to equip them with the tools to ensure that they're not only resilient in the face of these climate risks, but that they can thrive. Um, so that's that's how we are, we are um, preparing or, or helping to prepare our customers in the face of these uh, risks. This is great to hear. Thank you, Debbie. Diana. So how can we think about engaging and involving employees and guests, us, we still travel a lot, and uh, in the process of reducing the climate impact of aviation? Well, it's really important that we do so. Um, so first on the employee side, uh, operational efficiency, running a really tight operation that avoids fuel use relies on all of our employees being involved in that and making individual decisions tons of times over and over a day. Um, and so, you know, one of the things to do is look at what are the procedures that we need to update all of that stuff. But we made a change a couple of years ago to actually integrate into our performance-based pay uh, system. So we have a goals-based um, performance pay system for all of our employees that pays out every year. And uh, we integrated a carbon efficiency uh, metric into that. So 10% of everybody's bonus at the end of the year is based on whether or not we hit our carbon targets. Um, and we all share them from the CEO um, throughout frontline operations. Uh, and, you know, we debated do we sort of wait and um, include that target once everyone sort of understands exactly what it means, or do we include the target and then they ask, well, <laughs> what does this mean? How do I, what do I do about it? We did the second, and we've had some really good conversations um, to, uh, and we need to continue to do a better job to communicate and help people understand the impact that they can individually have on that target. On the customer side, um, there's sort of two, uh, two customer segments that I'll talk about. One is, um, and the one uh, where I think we spend more time right now are corporate customers for business travel, and then there's individual guests, as you mentioned. Um, corporate customers for business travel are more engaged in this conversation. They're making, starting to make different decisions and uh, take action to offset their own scope three footprint. 
And uh, we need that partnership because I talked about sustainable aviation fuels. There's not enough of it and it's way too expensive. And the economics of an airline are such that we just simply can't buy a ton of fuel at several dollars more than traditional fuel. So we need a partnership from public policy to reduce that cost, but also from corporate customers who are willing to say, okay, let's try to jumpstart this market by sharing in that cost. And the airline benefits from the scope one footprint reduction and the business traveler uh, or the company um, sponsoring the business travel uh, benefits from the reduction in their supply chain footprint. Um, and so Microsoft was one of the first uh, companies to do this work with us. Um, we now have five uh, corporate customers that are working with us and, and many that are in the pipeline. Um, and we look forward to growing that program in the next couple of years. The, get, the individual guest is sort of the next stage. And um, we haven't seen individuals want to invest to a high degree in carbon offsets. We haven't made offsetting with SAF available yet, but we uh, look forward to doing that in the future. Um, and so really kind of a focus there is education and helping um, people think about the different decisions that they can make, even to bring your own water bottle and fill it before you get on board. That saves waste, that saves uh, material, uh, not directly related to carbon emissions, but all of those things do add up and starts making people more conscious about those individual decisions. Wow, the things that we need to think about, huh? Wow, amazing. Okay, I bring my water on the flight now. Nice. I promise, okay. So, uh, so I mean, question to you. So we, we used to just pay our electric bill, right? And wait for the utility company to give us electricity and keep the lights on, right? Now we think about solar, smart homes. The individuals are becoming more empowered, right? What do you see from the auto grid point of view about that trend about empowerment of the individual to control basically their own energy needs? Yeah, as I uh, mentioned previously, I think uh, these empowered customers, prosumers are really at the heart of energy transition. And we just need to see how to uh, create products that make it very easy for them to participate in these economies. A lot of prosumers have the right intention around uh, uh, around, around changing their behavior, but it's not always easy. There's a lot of friction uh, in the market. So I think from a technology perspective, I see probably uh, three sort of big areas where we can uh, reduce the friction that exists in this prosumer economy. And uh, I think first is just this whole concept of marketplaces. I think, just, uh, I think that there is a lot of uh, opportunity here to connect consumers who have the right intention with the products and services, and it's not easy to find these products and services all the time. Even simple things like, uh, how do I get my uh, electric charger installed? Uh, uh, I mean, uh, it, it can require a lot of surveys and site visits and things like that, or maybe an upgrade to a uh, electricity connection and, and things like that. So, so like creating a network around that, and then the second big uh, area is AI. I mean, I think a lot of us are looking at uh, chat GPT. We were talking about it and all kinds of applications uh, of, of AI. But uh, within the energy transition and power sector, uh, I feel that uh, AI is, one, is going to be very disruptive. We have been uh, applying that around balancing of the grid. But everything from finding new materials to understanding consumer behavior, making sure that uh, the the disruption or inconvenience that a consumer faces, whether it's a, a re residential consumer or, uh, or a commercial industrial business, I'm, I'm bucketing all of that in the consumer category. How do, you, how do we do this uh, while keeping track of the business imperatives, the, uh, the personal uh, sort of uh, constraints that they face? So this is where I feel uh, AI plays a fundamental role because on one hand, you want power, which is dispatch grade. You press a button, electrons show up. It's the ultimate just-in-time supply chain uh, that exists, uh, the greatest engineering feat of, 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 of uh, humankind uh, over the last century. But now with renewables, that paradigm is changing. So the only way to really keep the system still running is to now bring another dimension into this equation, which is what happens on the customer side of the equation. So I, I think AI is a is a big, big area. And I think uh, we are already seeing a lot of uh, customers now going and buying batteries or in the commercial space, they're buying microgrids. 
uh, we need to make sure that uh, that uh, there is a uh, there is an economic uh, benefit or value proposition in addition to the climate uh, change imperative and value proposition as well. Yeah. No, that's good. One more question for you, Diana, and then we wrap up with a question to, for the three of you. You know, we talked about your uh, your customers, right? You talk about customer, corporate customers and also the guests, individual guests, right? What are your thoughts around cross-industry collaboration? Do you see that anything you could do could be done um, more at that level? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, some of the um, there are uh, many examples, but certainly in thinking about creating sustainable aviation fuel, there are uh, cross benefits. For example, between um, the rest of the clean energy industry or utilities that are looking for clean energy solutions um, and some of the inputs into the sustainable aviation fuel um, supply chain. So that's just sort of one example that's more cross industry but within sector. Um, more broadly, I think the example of, you know, a Microsoft saying, hey, we actually care about growing the future of the sustainable aviation fuel market or the other companies that have come to the table and wanted to learn more um, thinking outside your direct uh, sort of line of purview or your direct product and saying, what are the other technologies in my supply chain and how do I enable those? I think that provides a real opportunity in the future. Makes sense. So one question that I'll ask the three of you, I'll go to you, Debbie. What is the responsibility of the C-suite of leadership? And what role does leadership need to play in responding to and managing this ripple effect of climate change? So I don't think this is going to surprise anyone, but I think there's growing pressure from investors, consumers, employees on the C-suite to be responsible for responding to and managing the risks and opportunities of climate change. And frankly, it's not just the responsibility of the C-suite, but the board as well to be climate competent. And what I mean by that is being educated enough on the subject matter to make informed decisions, which may include hiring experts like myself and Diana to create strategies and programs to manage those risks and identify opportunities for growth in these areas, putting governance structures in place to manage the risks and provide feedback. Um, really the C-suite, as you said, are the leaders of the company. They set the tone and overall direction for all the business units. Um, and I think it's critical for them to track progress on climate goals like any other business goals, communicate that progress across the company and align business units to those goals. Um, and I'll just end you know, by saying that climate change is having profound effects on the way we live and the way that we do business. You know, It impacts all of us and we all have the responsibility to take action. Thank you, Debbie. Amit. Well, I mean, 10 years ago, when I started in this space, everybody used to ask me, are you in climate tech? Are you in energy tech? Today, I think every company is a climate tech company, and they should have that mindset. Uh, and uh, whether you're looking at energy as a subset or climate more broadly, uh, I mean, this is not an afterthought. Everybody has to, I mean, all the C-suite and the board, as you said earlier, has to lead with it. Uh, one thing I would like to add is that uh, while climate change affects everybody, it doesn't affect everybody equally. So as we are thinking about this energy transition, we have to really think about uh, equity and justice and how it is bringing the entire society forward. It's a great opportunity for job creation and improving the standard of living globally. And I think uh, we should uh, make sure that the actions and policies and investments that we are making uh, are inclusive and are bringing uh, the whole world forward with us. Thank you. Diana? Yeah, that's great. Um, one of the reasons I like the word sustainability is it's very practical. To It means we have to sustain for the long term. Um, and we have 23,000 employees, and we want to make sure that we've got those and many more great jobs that can grow um, long into the future. Um, and we're celebrating 90 years of uh, being in business this year. So it makes us think about sort of that longevity. So if you think about it from that lens, I think our responsibility is um, first to sort of learn and be curious and make sure that we understand kind of what's going on in the in climate as well as in, um, I love the comment that every, uh, bi every business is a climate tech business now. 
Um, the second thing is we have this sort of mantra at Alaska called control what you can control. So what are the things that we have power to control? And let's put the systems in place to, to uh, manage those. And then what's outside of that sphere, let's make sure we're building the partnerships or calling on government or other um, uh, uh, partners to try to make progress. And that includes trying to make the economics work for some of this in the future um, so that it truly can be sustainable on all fronts. Thank you. Thank you to you, Diana, and thank you, Amit, and thank you, De Debbie, for joining us remotely. Thank you to all of you for joining us. But you see, the discussion we just had was all around thinking about the impact that many organizations and corporations are doing to the planet when you think about carbon footprint, and we just uh, talked about this. But it is also important to think about the impact that the climate will have to our supply chains, to our stakeholders, to our people, to our families, and people are not impacted the same way. And I truly believe personally that the cooperation that will do good for the planet and also manage this climate risk, would, it will make them more sustainable for the future. With that, thank you very much for joining us today. I appreciate it. Thank you.